Good morning. We'll now call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. It's 9 a.m., February 15th. Clerk, uh, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Thank you. Have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, before we proceed, I see that we have a number of members uh, in the audience who are not wearing masks. It is uh, county policy that masks are re still required in all public places. I'm going to have to ask you to put on your masks, or uh, if you do not, we'll have to recess the Board of Supervisors meeting uh, and for five minutes and continue the meeting entirely virtually. 80,000 people in the Super Bowl not wearing masks. When are we going to drop the charade? Our children are still going to school with hey, masks hey. on. We're done. We're done no, with we're the done. circus. We are we're done. done with the We'll now recess the Board of Supervisors meeting for five minutes. Thank you. All of those, you are all conflicted. You're ruining. Now resume the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, and once again, Clerk, will you just please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. I will now have a moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. Is there any member of the board who uh, wishes to dedicate anything today? Yes, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, I'd just like to dedicate this moment to Daryl Darling, who recently passed away, as many of you know, um, an absolute gift for social justice, not just here, but across the country, uh, an absolute uh, line of compassion for our community, always made time for people in need always made time to provide advice, always fought for those that had less, and he just passed away. And so I'd like to uh, dedicate this moment of silence to Daryl Darling. Thank you. And, and, and Mr. Chair, I'd like to appreciate uh, Supervisor Friend for mentioning Daryl and his tremendous legacy. There's a few other people uh, to, I wanted to mention who passed away recently, and uh, normally we don't do this, but I think it's sort of a testament uh, in this moment of time to how Life is short, but people have made uh, profound contributions through their service to our community. Um, and we're grateful for everyone. But um, Dennis McGinley with my uncle, uh, taught for 25 years in alternative schools here in Santa Cruz uh, to kids most at risk. Jim Marshall, who ran a preschool program uh, and served on Child Care Advisory Council for decades. Um, Sylvia Karras, who emailed us all uh, regularly about mental health issues uh, in this county. Donna Dunderdale, who ran Made in Santa Cruz uh, stores uh, and products and, you know, sold the brand of Santa Cruz to, to the community and visitors alike. Colonel Edward Leskowitz, who uh, served in the military, uh, for uh, made a career for the U.S. Marine Corps and raised a family here in Santa Cruz and contributed to our community. And George Escobar, who worked for the city of Santa Cruz for 40 years and was always uh, had a smile on his face and is in public service to the community. And um, there are many other people people who have uh, who obviously have passed and contributed, um, but hopefully it's a small sample of the kinds of uh, amazing people we have in the community and our wishes uh, to their friends and family as, as they mourn. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Cabot. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, during the moment, moment of silence, uh, I'd like to uh, recognize the uh, passing of Judy Doring Nelson in uh, South County and all the wonderful work she did for the community. I won't try to list everything she's done. She did. And uh, during the moment of silence, we'll remember her contribution to South County. Thank you. Thank you. With uh, all of those dedications in mind, we'll now have a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Let me move to item three, consideration of late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions to consent and regular agendas. CAO yes. Blasio, do we have any additions or deletions? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Koenig and members of the board. Uh, there's um, on the consent agenda, there's an addendum, item number 62. There's additional materials, uh, letter of support for California microbusiness COVID-19 relief grant program, uh, packet pages 982 through 986. And then on the regular agenda, item number 12, a staff requests that this item be deleted, uh, remove packet pages 66 through 82. And that concludes the uh, corrections additions to the agenda. Thank you, CAO. Yes, uh, and for item number 12, we will, um, some of the water districts just requested additional time to review this item. And so we've called uh, a meeting with uh, all the water districts and uh, departments throughout the county to, to review this. So thank you. I will now move uh, to item four, announcement by board members of items removed from consent to regular agenda. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull item 62 just for additional discussion. All right, we'll pull item 62 and that will become item 15.1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. During our afternoon session. Okay, uh, yes, uh, it's, it's not in the um, a removal of an item, but I uh, just want to make an announcement that we, uh, the Santa Cruz County uh, from the California State Association of Counties has announced that we have received merit awards through our uh, Santa Cruz County's treating addiction through peer mentors and county the county's operational plan strategy into action programs. Those are recognized as getting merit awards from the California State Association of Counties. Uh, thank you to all our employees and everyone who made this uh, recognition happen. It's indeed an honor to uh, get these awards. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Any other items that folks would like to remove? All right, seeing none, we will now move on to public comment. Any person may address the board during this public comment period. Speakers must not exceed two minutes in length of time. And individuals may speak only once during public comment. All public comments must be directed to an item listed on today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, yet to be heard on the regular agenda, or a topic not on the agenda that is within the jurisdiction of the board. Board members will not take action or respond immediately to any public communication presented regarding topics, but may choose to follow up later, either individually or on a subsequent Board of Supervisors agenda. And uh, Clerk, do you want to provide any specifications for how people can participate today? Yes, thank you, Chair. Este anuncio se repetirá en español. Now is the time for the public comment. If you wish to comment and are joining us in chamber online, please use the raise hand feature. If you are dialing in, please press star nine to be placed in the queue to speak. We will call you by your name or by the last four digits of your phone number. We ask that you please state your name at the beginning of your comment. Once you begin speaking, the timer will begin. The countdown timer will display on screen and will end automatically. If you're calling by phone, once again, it is star nine to raise your hand, and star six to mute and unmute your phone. Ahora es el tiempo que la Junta Directiva de Supervisores recibirá comentarios del público. Si usaría dar su comentario y se ha unido a través de Zoom, por favor busque el icono de la mano en el fondo de la pantalla y hazle clic para levantar la mano. Esto lo colocará, colocará en la fila para hablar. Cuando sea tu turno de hablar, te llamaré por tu nombre o los últimos cuatro números de tu teléfono. Por favor, accepte y comience a hablar. Si se ha unido a través de teléfono, por favor, marque estrella 9 para levantar la mano. Para accesar tu micrófono, por favor, oprime estrella 6 para activar y desactivar tu micrófono. Al fin de tus dos minutos, tu micrófono será desactivado automáticamente. Gracias. First speaker, Carol, your microphone is available. Um, good morning. This is Carol Bjorn. I wanted to let you all know that we are still 
here um, in the chambers um, waiting to see at least Manu face to face. We have a lot of things to say. We actually have minors here, very young people that would love to speak. Um, and so we'd really appreciate the time and opportunity to give to them to speak. Um, here's the problem. As we approach the two year anniversary of the COVID state of emergency, the argument that we must or we have to follow CDPH guidance becomes increasingly harder to support. As each day passes, you all, the schools, the school districts and the county office of education have a much harder time justifying following guidance due to an emergency. Instead of the Emergency Services Act applying, the Administrative Procedures Act should apply. This is because the mandates and guidance look more like regulations from an executive agency and, and CDPH is just using the guise of emergency to implement its regulations. Unfortunately, the CDPH did not even attempt to follow the legal requirements outlined in the Administrative Procedures Act, which begins at Government Code Section 11340. Um, that act requires that guidelines be adopted according to specific procedures in order to qualify as regulations that have the force and effect of law. None of these guidelines or mandates have the force and effect of law. Let's stop acting like they do. In addition, I brought to you all, I have hard copies of a wonderful letter that's been sent to the state assembly, the state senate, signed by over 100 educators in the state of California asking that all of the testing, uh, all of the masking, all of the mandates go by the wayside. This is ridiculous. Our children's mental health is suffering. There was literally a suicide in Scotts Valley two weeks ago and all of our children are suffering. They have depression, anxiety. They want to be kids. Let them be kids today. That was great. Thanks. <laughs> um, All in user three, your microphone is available. As a reminder, it is star six to unmute your phone. <clears throat> oh, good morning, um, board and County of Santa Cruz. My name is Linda Black, and uh, I am calling to uh, talk about the fact that only 80 rebuild permits have been issued out of the over 900 homes that were lost in the CZU complex fires in August of 2020. That means that there are over 800 families out there still not living in their homes, still unable to rebuild for whatever reason. And I sincerely hope that this board is going to take this seriously and make some steps to make it possible for these families to rebuild. Not only are these families without homes, that means these families are also putting extended pressure on our very limited housing market as it already is. And it is beyond a shame and a calamity and really very disgraceful when I'm seeing the reasons for not being able to rebuild the countless requirements and the countless permitting processes that these people must go through. And I know that there are variances available and there must be some sort of emergency variances possible. If we can have this health emergency to protect our health, it seems like we can certainly have some sort of a housing emergency set up so that some of these things can be waived for people to get back into their homes. And it's, again, I'm still not hearing whether or not these people are being charged permit fees. If they're still being charged permit fees, those fees need to be waived. There are millions of dollars in the general fund that we all pay in property taxes, where does this money go? It seems like a perfect place for this money to be used would be helping these people get back on their feet. And I am just appalled to see the article in today's Sentinel that only 80 people have been given the right to rebuild. Thank you. Please look forward and make a change. Thank you. Elizabeth, your microphone is available. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Good morning. This is Elizabeth McCollum. First of all, <clears throat> um, 
I wanted to tell you that each of you, um, and Sheriff Jim Hart, Superintendent of Schools Fair Sabah, and the Public Health Officer Gail Newell, have had now in your position possession for several weeks documents that um, were mailed certified to you, which are addressing the criminal conspiracy of coronavirus. Um, and yet nothing has been done to stop these crimes from being committed on the people here in this county under the guise of a health emergency. These documents are also in the hands of every state attorney general and state senator. Um, yesterday, a group of concerned citizens, including myself, filed a proposed criminal indictment with the Santa Cruz County Chief Prosecutor. These documents were researched and penned by Dr. David Martin. They're similar to what you received. Um, it also included a 300 plus page dossier citing the crimes. Um, all of the evidence is contained therein to start a criminal investigation, which will lead to indictments and arrests. So I just want to say, it's really, it behooves you to read that document that you received certified. Because as elected or not elected officials in the county, you are criminally complicit in this indictment if you do nothing about the crimes for fraud. So much has happened over the past two years. It is almost impossible to keep track of all of it. But every action in this board and the public health officer and the school intendant have taken based upon this hoax as it created the fear which has driven a lot of what carol was just talking about so the real harm is being done and all of you are responsible i'm just encouraging you to grab that document or talk to the da and do something thank you call in user two your microphone is available Hi, this is Marilyn Vera. Thank you to the previous speakers. Um, and I like to say also stop all these mandates, stop this fraud and harm to the community members under a so called emergency guise. I'd like to read from Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s keynote presentation at Wise Traditions 2021. The title is, When Money Intersects Public Health Policy. I've been working on the intersection of money with public health policy for 40 years, long before I got into the vaccine racket. I was suing Smithfield, Tyson, Bo Pilgrim, Frank Perdue, and more big factory farms and factory farm companies than any attorney in the world. I spent a lot of time working with farmers unions in 20 states, traveling all around and eating good food. I've learned the connection, the links between the soil and democracy and good health, human dignity, and all the things we ought to be caring about. I love the fact that the mantra of the Weston A. Price Foundation, you can see this talk at westonaprice.org, is about being wise about the traditions that connect us to the 20,000 generations of human beings that were here before there were laptops. That wisdom ultimately connects us to God. The word wisdom means knowledge of God's will. It means an instinctive knowledge about the difference between right and wrong. He Thank you. Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, no one else seems to have reported to you this morning the problem that I had in accessing your meeting this morning using the um, ID code that is printed at the top of the agenda. Zoom reports it is an invalid number when I called the um, supervisor's office. The uh, lady was kind enough to give me the correct number. So I want to make it clear for the record that there may be people 
trying to get in that cannot. Um, so, and thank you to the, the kind lady in the supervisor's office that gave me the correct number. I also want to um, applaud the efforts of many of your speakers here before me that are fighting this um, charade, if you will, of all of the, the mask mandates and the harm that it is doing to our youth. It is troubling. So please do read that document that you have been given and take action on behalf of the people and especially our youth. I also want to applaud the speaker talking about only 80 permits being given out so far for the CZU fire area. I have friends that are trying to build up there and it is appalling what they are being told they have to do and cannot do. And we are not helping them rebuild. So I urge your board to consider removing all permit fees for these people and allow them to get back into their homes. Uh, Cal Fire is also a big hurdle with access being blocked in many areas. Um, your board requested an after action review of the CZU fire from Cal Fire and I've not seen it uh, supplied and I did write your board and ask if you have received it. I've not received a reply yet. But Thank you. Serge Cagno, your microphone is available. Good morning. Uh, my name is Serge Cagno. I'm the secretary of the Mental Health Advisory Board. Uh, good morning, Chair Koenig, Supervisor Caput as a member of the Mental Health Advisory Board and other members of the Board of Supervisors. a bridge towards that? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing other voices at the same time. As um, a reminder to all participants, please be sure to mute your microphone. Uh, the Mental Health Advisory Board is proud of the report, which you'll be voting on as item number 32. We act as that group. We act as a group diligently uh, supporting the equitable access for quality mental health services in our county. To further this goal, we invite you to our meeting this Thursday at 3 p.m. We'll, we'll be having a presentation by Dr. Kenneth Minkoff, co-chair of a nationally recognized report titled The Roadmap to the Ideal Crisis System. We've invited law enforcement from the different um, jurisdictions. Um, we've reached out to mental health, different departments within the county um, and other shareholders for an, an ongoing series of town halls um, where we can do an evaluation of our crisis behavioral health systems, find the gaps, and find solutions together collaboratively, uh, which address the, the issues of each of the jurisdictions. A flyer has been emailed to each member of the Board of Supervisors, but you can also find it on the Mental Health Advisory Board County webpage. Thank you very much, and have a great day, and stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Cogno. Next speaker, Julio uh, Neri Andrade. Your microphone is unmuted. Yes, thank you. I'm actually here just to translate for a couple of our promotoras de salud. Okay, thank you. Justin Norgren uh, uh, just dropped off. Angelica Caballero. Angélica Caballero, ahora es tu turno de hablar. Puede estar tu comentario en español y Julio te lo va a traducir. Ok, muy bien. Um, buenos días. Mi nombre es Angélica Caballero y soy promotora de salud del condado de Santa Cruz. Como promotora me ha ayudado mucho en mi familia. Pues ahora sé a qué, qué recursos hay en la comunidad, pero sobre todo me ha ayudado para crear conciencia en nuestra comunidad y ayudar Uh, hemos ayudado a muchas personas a crear confianza sobre las vacunas de COVID, ya que en estos momentos, pues, ya mucho, cuando comenzó había mucha desconfianza, inseguridad y muchos miedos. Uh, como promotora de salud, me honra saber que ayudé a muchas personas a que no les pasara lo mismo que a las que no tuvieron oportunidad 
en mi familia hubo uh, cercana, o sea, familia cercana que falleció. Desgraciadamente las vacunas todavía no estaban disponibles. Uh, nosotros pasamos por momentos muy difíciles con, con todo esto del COVID y el ser promotora, pues gracias a Dios me ayudó mucho. Uh, quiero decir que estoy agradecida por este programa y que seguiré trabajando y luchando, siguiendo promoviendo la vacuna porque sé que es la mejor opción. Y la, la comunidad emigrante hispana creo que ha tenido mucha confianza en nosotros porque somos igual que ellos, somos madres de familia. Yo tengo un niño en la escuela Laibu y otra niña de 19 años. Y, y eso creo que les ha dado confianza para creer y, y dejarse ayudar un poco de lo que nosotros hemos aprendido. Creo que es todo. Muchas gracias por darme la oportunidad de hablar. Okay, so now I'll translate. So, first of all, thank you. My, good morning. My name is Angelica Caballero, and I'm a promotor of the salud through the county of Santa Cruz. Uh, one of the things that she enjoys about being a promotor is that she uh, can guide families to resources in the community. And also, she feels like this role has helped her create great relationships with people around her uh, by guiding them to resources that they need. Uh, one of the things that they're actually promoting right now is um, to make people understand the, the importance of getting vaccinated. Uh, so on her, on her family side, she, uh, she has a couple of family members who passed away, and that was because the vaccine was not available during that time. Uh, so she sees her role as an important piece to the community because this builds trust within the community members, especially around the Latino community. Thank you, Ms. Caballero. Diana Valdez, your microphone is available. Promotora Valdez, tu micrófono no está disponible. Si gustaría dar su comentario en español. Sí, sí me escuchan. Buenos días. Sí, buenos días. Sí, te escuchamos. Ok, buenos días. Um, gracias. Este, como lo dijeron, mi nombre es Diana Valdez y soy una... Uh, también una promotora de la salud de aquí de Laibo, del condado de Santa Cruz. Este, yo quiero decir que estoy muy agradecida con el condado de Santa Cruz, de salud de Santa Cruz, porque ellos nos han brindado todo el apoyo para poder llegar a donde estamos nosotros. En mi comunidad había mucha inseguridad, no sabían muchas veces a quién acercarse o a quién acudir para tener los servicios que la gente necesitaba. Y creo que hoy en día estamos formando confianza, creamos conciencia entre la comunidad, como dijo mi compañera, a la comunidad latina, a la comunidad hispana, los inmigrantes. Es un punto bien importante tocar eso porque muchas veces por ser inmigrante las personas no quieren acercarse a pedir ayudas o a pedir los recursos que hay. Entonces a mí me da mucho gusto saber que por parte de nosotras como promotoras podemos hacer que el recurso llegue a las personas que lo necesitan. Por otra parte, también me da mucho gusto escuchar que hay personas que están hablando eh, de salud mental. Hoy en día, a través de la pandemia, a la salud mental ha sido una parte importantísima en la comunidad, no nada más en la mía, sino a nivel mundial, pienso yo. Este, con todo esto que hemos pasado, la, la, los niños, los adultos, las madres, las padres, tenemos mucha ansiedad, miedo por lo que está pasando, pero... Tenemos que saber que hay recursos y que esos recursos están aquí para nosotros y que nosotros como promotoras estamos aquí para ayudarlos. Muchas gracias y, y gracias por uh, escuchar nuestras palabras. Sí, perfecto. So, her name is Niana Valadez. She's also a promotora de salud through Live, uh, Live Oak um, School District to cradle to career. Uh, so she is very thankful to the public health uh, for the support and all the resources that they provide. Uh, one of the things that she also mentioned was about the importance of, of how Latinos and illegal immigrants feel comfortable uh, approaching them because they can get them to the resources. Uh, one of the things that she mentioned is that sometimes uh, Latino community are hesitant to ask for help. Uh, so by building this uh, connection with Promotora de Salud, a uh, member of the community uh, can help them guide those, have, help them guide to those resources Uh, one one of the things that she really liked about uh, people are mentioning during this meeting is that about mental health. 
the importance of mental health and how a lot of our children are being um, affected by the, this pandemic. Uh, but she wants to tell people that there's resources available through us. Uh, it can be through the county, it can be through other special clinics uh, across, the, across the, the county. And uh, to feel comfortable asking for support and help. Uh, that's one of the things that Promotoras de Salud are doing, making feel people comfortable about approaching or the proper resources that the community members might need. Thank you, Ms. Valdez. Moto G Power, your microphone is available. Hello. Hello. Hello Thank you. you. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak to you today. First of all, I am going to make some assumptions about you. You are as all intelligent, educated, and well-meaning people who want to do what is best for our children. I ask you to use this intelligence to listen to what I have to say and use common sense to come to this logical conclusion that the school mandates on children should be dropped. First of all, I will briefly discuss the mask mandate. At the beginning of the emergency, we knew very little. Many studies, over 50 now, have been done on the effectiveness of masks all of kinds. Even the best of masks have been found to only be nominally effective at stopping the spread of the so-called virus. Recently, a study by Brown University found that there has been 23% dive in young children's verbal and language skills development. I see this as our precious five-year-old granddaughters. Um, this is due to masking. For the push for children to get the mRNA gene altering shot should be stopped immediately. The so-called vaccine does not block transmission. This has been admitted by our own CDC. There has been inadequate studies on the shot and how they affect us in the future. What we are seeing in our world today is governments using tyrannical measures to control the people. It is about control, not health. In addition, money is a huge motivator. $15 billion has been given to the schools. As you know, there are strings attached. With the facts we now know, it is common sense to put a stop to these measures, which is- Thank you. Caller 1999, your microphone is available. As a reminder to star six to unmute your phone. Good morning, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I'll deal with it. You know, there used to be five kids in here. They could do a much splendid better job as supervisors than all of you. The law enforcement that's in the building on the fifth floor really was very polite and are doing what they're supposed to do, supporting the public. You guys don't really support the public. Um, I thought we had three minutes. I guess we don't. This is what I came here to say. When any fact checkers use the entity to directly check the facts about the entity and accept that entity's answer without actually digging dig deeper, integrity can be diminished. For example, just on February 11th, David Martin's use of public information that uses facts from those involved in the VAX products that are creating the greatest crimes against all human beings on earth so far. Directly linking Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, a young global leader, to directly profiting from the VAX inoculation, and then using police and military to cover up his lies. Where would this lead as far as the other 12,000 young global leaders under the direction of Klaus Schwab under the direction of Henry Kissinger. Is it possible that these frauds are being done by more than these 12,000 individuals down to every city and council person who's aware and swore an oath to their country's sovereign citizen? 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. He said Santana Vasquez, your microphone is available. Hola, buenos días a todos. Soy mamá y promotora de salud. Mi nombre es Lizette Santana. Y quiero compartirles que cuando inicié como promotora de salud durante la capacitación, lo acepté porque pensé que esos temas y tópicos que íbamos a aprender durante la capacitación me iban a funcionar como en mi rol como mamá. Pero no fue hasta después de que mi hijo tomó la vacuna y él se sintió completamente seguro y feliz y vi que no había ninguna que él estaba bien, que estaba sano, pues compartimos este testimonio con nuestras familias. Tengo a mi bebé a un lado. Y Y solo puedo decir que, que ser promotoras es un enlace a la comunidad y es un enlace a informarnos y compartir esa información de una forma segura. Creo que ahora hay más mamás que se están preparando para ser promotoras y está aumentando el interés de la comunidad acerca de este tema y queremos seguir siendo ese enlace de la comunidad hacia el sistema de salud. Promotoras es poder navegar en un sistema de salud seguro y acercarnos y combatir esos temas utópicos que hay en la comunidad. Lo siento, gracias. So, my name is Lisa Santana. I'm a mom and a promotor of salud. Uh, during the, she says that, that her experience is uh, very well. Uh, welcome that she at the beginning took this training as an opportunity for her to develop some skills as a mom but after her son got um, vaccinated she saw how happy and secure her son felt so that motivated her even more to give back to the community uh, she feels like this is a bridge uh, with two guy community members over to resources that they provide across the county and that that's one of the things that she really enjoys about this. And she likes the fact that there's more promotoras getting involved. And it talks about how great the program is and how comfortable feel are trusting the promotoras to uh, identify them to the resources they need. Uh, so they feel like this is a, a great program and she just wants to extend her gratitude and um, thank the uh, public health for the support. And of course, all of you uh, in this meeting, and that's because um, we could have done this without you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Vax Vasquez. Last call for speakers. As a reminder, it is star nine to raise your hand or please press the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Kim Smith, your microphone is available. Yes, uh, this is actually Justin Green Star is having technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm here for my son and my son Hunter is now going to speak and tell you all what he's experienced in this county. I am Hunter. I am here today to tell my story of how I am being treated in school. I have missed four days of school this month because I have not taken the vaccine or gave to be tested weekly because of that I spent an entire day in the office away from my class. For the next three days, I was isolated from my classmates in an abandoned classroom. With staff success that looked like a zombie apocalypse, I was not allowed to run, play, or eat lunch with other students. I ate home. I had a in uh, had a session. I was in um alone with a substitute teacher. That does not seem right to me. I am here because the rules at the school do not make sense. I am here asking for me and all the kids 
to stop this nonsense. The school's COVID-19 policies are hurting us more than they are helping us. Thank you. Yay! Yay! Yeah, thank you, Hunter. There are no other speakers wishing to speak at public comment. Thank you, Clerk. Then we'll now move to item six, action on the consent agenda. Are there any members of the board who I would like to comment on items on consent? Uh, Supervisor Caput. Uh, you're on mute, Supervisor Cap. There we go. Yeah, thank you. I'll make quick comments on number 22, the Pajaro Valley Health Care District. Uh, we'll be taking applications for people to uh, um, actually serve on that district board and uh, how important it is to the whole county that the Watsonville Hospital basically stays open. Uh, I would hate to think of uh, all the patients or people that are in need uh, going from Watsonville all the way over to uh, uh, Dominican or Sutter Hospital. If you think you're busy now, you'll be a lot busier in the future if we don't keep uh, the Watsonville Hospital open. And uh, number 32, the Mental Health Advisory Board report. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Serge, uh, for your comments that you made earlier. Uh, number 46, uh, we'll be doing renovations on the Freedom Boulevard Health uh, Clinic and uh, uh, facility out there. There's a mental health facility out there also with counselors, and uh, uh, there's also uh, a health clinic and uh, dental work that's being offered to people in South County. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Supervisor Coonerty? Sure, thank you. Uh, just two quick comments. First on item number 23, which is forgivable loans to women and minority-owned businesses. Just want to thank staff. I thought this was a really good approach and use of the funds um, and supporting child care providers. Uh, during this time, during any time is critical. Post COVID, it's essential to get our economy back up and going and, and, you know, give the resources to kids that they need. Uh, I do want to, uh, urge that if all the funds are not expended, that we look at a, maybe a second round of funding. $10,000 is, uh, as a forgivable loan is, is great. Um, but the, the hole is deep and these providers may need uh, more support. Um, and so uh, to, if, if there aren't enough applications, then we should look at a, a second round. Um, and then on item number 61, which is a long awaited Davenport water line, I just want to thank uh, the Department of Public Works, Ashley Trujillo and Kenny Eaton for their work. Um, this was an incredible opportunity to leverage these state funds in a way that uh, Davenport ratepayers who pay among the highest highest water rates in the state of California um, will not have to bear the cost for these uh, critical system improvements. So thank you to everyone who's put in many years of work in order to make, uh, make this project happen. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a couple items on no, item number 26, the SEIU agreement. I thank our labor partners and our county leadership who worked on this agreement. I'm glad we have come to a resolution that will maintain the services for our community. Um, our work source has been essential in providing services during these two years of the pandemic, as well as the CZU fire. And they will continue to be critical as we mitigate uh, and navigate uh, the new challenges that labor. We look forward to improve our services in the future. Uh, on item 27, uh, this is uh, essential to complete cleanup efforts uh, from the CZU fire. I appreciate the feedback we have received from the companies in the field who are involved in the ongoing cleanup and for the board's support of uh, this extension. Um, on items 28 through 37, these are the commission reports, several of them. This is a great opportunity to thank all the members of our county commissions and committees for their services to the community and to the advice and expertise they lend to the county. I also wanna thank members of our staff who guide these advisory bodies and provided uh, the necessary support to make their efforts worthwhile. Uh, there's hundreds of people involved, involved in the more than two dozen uh, when you get committees and commissions, we have probably about 40 of them in the county. 
So thank you each and every one of you for your input. And on uh, items number 43 and 44, the whole person care and substance abuse uh, disorder services. Uh, I just want to acknowledge how critical uh, and complex these programs are and how important it is that the board uh, that the uh, board and the public understand that these services entail um, and what their, are their outcomes. Uh, I wish we had more time to dedicate uh, to them today as they represent some of the biggest quality of life concerns we hear about regularly from our constituents. Um, I'll have some additional questions on item 14 this afternoon related to behavioral health and the relationship between those initiatives and these two pilot programs discussed on the consent agenda on items 43 and 44. And finally, again, uh, the items 56 to 58, the storm damage repair. My ongoing thanks to Public Works for its continued efforts to address the storm damage repair. Most notably in the 5th District and today's agenda dealing with Bean Creek Road and Mount Charlie Road and East Siani Road. Uh, we have to remember that the stored damage work comes in addition to the scheduled road maintenance managed by the Public Works each year. And we know the community is grateful for these efforts. Um, it's above and beyond the call of duty and I really appreciate Public Works for their work, continuous works there to get us back on track and on the road again. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one brief comment on item 22, which is a, a very important item on our agenda regarding uh, the process for creation of the, the initial board for the new health district. Obviously, great appreciation for everybody, uh, both the local and state delegation that has worked to make this happen. But this, this first board is an absolutely essential that we choose a, a diverse and qualified group of people to help lead during this transition. I'm honored to be uh, joining with Supervisor Caput and some of our remarkable professional staff in order to help guide that process. Um, we encourage members of the community that are interested in applying to be sure that they uh, get their applications in on this. And we can, as Supervisor Caput noted, uh, provide for essential health services, not just for South County, but throughout the region by maintaining uh, the stability of this hospital and district. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well, just a couple comments. I concur with uh, Supervisor Kennedy's comments on item 23. Um, this is a really great use of $400,000 to support women and minority business recovery. And it's, it's really shocking that we lost 105 early childhood education facilities during the pandemic. Uh, so this money will really go a long way to getting, um, getting both families and businesses back uh, up to speed. It's great that we're working with El Pajaro CDC and can actually distribute these funds by the end of the year or anticipate being able to do so. Um, so thanks to staff for that. Uh, and then on item 55, the uh, 2022 tree trimming project, uh, just I'm glad to see that we're allocating a few hundred thousand dollars to tree trimming. My office receives many, many requests for tree trimming and uh, I think it'll be money well spent uh, given the increased fire risk that we're seeing. So uh, that's all my comments. Any um, one who would like to make a motion on the consent agenda? Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, clerk, please uh, roll call vote. Thank you. And for the record, this is for items 17 through 61. Item 62 has moved to the regular agenda. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the consent agenda being passed, uh, with the exception of item 62, which we'll hear as item 15.1. We'll now move on to item 7. Consider the general fund mid-year budget report with updated estimates for fiscal year 2021-2022, an update on fiscal year 2022-2023 impacts as outlined in the memorandum of the county administ administrative officer. And I will now have a uh, yes, CAO Palacios. Uh, thank you, Chair Koenig and members of the board. I'd like to present to you um, Marcus Pimentel, the County Budget Manager, will be giving the presentation today. Uh, I wanted to note, and just in summary, that uh, we have a lot of good news and things to be thankful for. Uh, chief among them is that our major revenue sources, as you'll see in the report, have fully recovered from before uh, the pandemic. So we, we're back to pre-pandemic um, rates uh, of revenue for our major revenue sources. So that's 
that's a good and healthy sign. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the worry that we have is mainly related to our response uh, to the pandemic and the CZU fire where uh, the county incurred um, millions of dollars uh, of expenses, over a hundred million combined. And our big issue is, you know, how much are we gonna get reimbursed from FEMA? Uh, what expenses will they disallow? When will those reimbursements come? And so they present um, a challenge uh, for our budget as we go forward into the budget year. And that's why we continue to recommend caution as the board has shown in the past. And luckily the board has been very, very prudent and cautious in the past. And it's allowed us to have good uh, reserves. Uh, but anyway, you will see in the presentation that we do have some outside risks uh, due to mainly our response to the twin emergencies of the CZU fire and uh, the health pandemic. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Pimentel, who will give the presentation um, to the board. Uh, good morning, Chair Koenig and members of the board. Before I begin, I just want to make sure you can see the presentation up on your screen. Again, great. Um, so thank you, uh, uh, County Administrative Officer Carlos Palacios for those opening remarks. Um, what I hope to do for you over these next coming uh, 20 minutes or so is to summarize our detailed major report that really is a bridge towards the release of our upcoming proposed 22-23 budget. Uh, again, this is just a summary of what is in our lengthy uh, report. Um, this presentation will focus on a uh, the update to our five-year forecast that really occurred for this fiscal year. I'll talk about our financial status, including some peer and statewide comparisons that illustrate how we are systematically unfunded as a county. I'll conclude with identifying our financial liabilities, near-term opportunities, and certainly be available for questions or comments. This is an informational presentation and we're at the beginning of a dialogue towards our 22-23 proposed budget. You've seen this updated forecast before. Uh, what has changed since January is the 21-22 fiscal year update. We are now projecting a structural imbalance of a net $7.7 .7 million in the current fiscal year. Um, this is based on receiving estimated actuals from our departments and incorporating some of our near-term liabilities and commitments, um, such as the, the amazing step forward to keep the Watsonville Community Hospital open. Uh, we will be reevaluating continually this forecast, and I expect to have some slight revisions when we develop and present to you our proposed 22-23 budget. If left uh, without action, this is, we would finish the year at 7.7 .7 million, but we will not let that happen. Staff plans to return on April 22nd, 2022, with essentially a kind of a mid-year 2.0 that we hope to provide some updates and some possible corrective measures should that imbalance continue. Uh, with these measures, uh, without these measures, without taking action, and if the $7.7 .7 million worst case scenario were to happen in an imbalance, we would still remain above our 7% minimum reserve funding level. Again, we'd remain above our minimum 7% funding level. What keeps me up at night is when I think about it as a percent of payroll. When we look at our general fund payroll, um, our current funded level of our reserves is about 6.5 pay periods. When we factor out some of our health and human initiatives that we like to use those reserves for, we really get down to covering just over three payroll cycles. That's not to alarm you, but that's just to you know, give a different perspective as a sense of operations impact. Um, again, we'll, we'll provide a little bit more information on this in our menu report, and we'll be coming back on April 26th, including things like the status of ARPA and some of our risks in our FEMA staff determinations. As we looked a little bit deeper into our, our cost segments over the last many years, we kind of see a trend, of course, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we were averaging about $8 million a year in new net contributions to sustain our county departments. Um, now that's great and that's phenomenal. It's been able to keep our services going, but we've not been able to invest in areas, including those identified in community priority polling nor to help identify and fund some of our issues within our aging facilities and, and infrastructure. We hope that to be a, a theme about coming up with new solutions to for both of those um, over the next um, year, year plus. So I guess I should speak 
of the slide, um, when I looked at the, the pre-pandemic levels, we had 37.4 million total in cost increases to our general fund commitments. And those were not necessary to expand programs or services. There were some on the fringes. It was really to sustain our operations as we face increasing cost um, pressures from um, our need to sustain services through personnel costs and, and wages. Diving a little bit deeper into that 37.4 million, um, this next slide illustrates where where those funding sources and financing sources went to. The 62% of that went to support our public safety uh, response services. Uh, as we look forward with the inclusion of a public defender's office, that will be a huge step forward in, in reducing systematic racism and other things. Um, those commitments will likely increase as we need to continue to invest in those areas. Um, that's not this slide is not meant to. Um, show any issues with where our funding has been. Those are some critical core areas of our cost commitments. It's just to illustrate where, where our funding pressures are coming from. You know, I just want to reiterate um, what is not included in these slides and what is not included in a lot of our cost models is funding for our aging infrastructure. Moving into what drove our forecasted change for this current year, um, when we adopted the budget, we were looking at, um, since we've adopted the budget, our costs, our net county costs for this current year are projected to increase by 10.6 million. While most of our county segments cost categories are on pace with the adopted budget, our health and human services and pandemic response is where we're seeing the biggest change. Um, we estimate that the county could incur a net $7.1 million in additional costs and FEMA denials just in this year alone from our pandemic response and the $5 million committed to keeping the Watson Community Hospital open. Um, that illustrates some of the major changes from our adopted budget to where we thought the mid-year estimate was going to our now what we're calling a projected alternate that includes the commitment to fund $5 million that is still contingent on action being taken. When layering in our revenues, and of course our revenues have been improving um, this current year and over the last several years, this, this slide layers in that, that impact of our general purpose net revenues available to fund our county operations. Again, while we're seeing growth, it is not sufficient enough to keep up with these cost pressures. Um, looking into our projected alternate forecast this year, that includes the funding for health and, <laughs> health and human services for pandemic response and for the Watson Community Hospital. Just this year alone is the snapshot we could end with a structural imbalance of 21.7 million. With the 14 million carried over from last fiscal year, that results with the financing gap of 7.7 .7 million. Again, we plan to return to the board on April 26, 2022 with some solution um, to bridging that gap should it continue. And now we'll move into um, what our reference is about systematic uh, underfunding, some revenue trends and conclude the presentation available for questions. Um, this slide illustrates what is talked about in our mid-year report, which we'll hit a little bit more in the subsequent report on item eight on the transient occupancy tax, is that when we look at our core revenue, revenue streams and our general purpose revenues, especially property tax and sales tax, when we look at our peers per capita or statewide comparisons or cities around us, we are consistently underfunded systematically in our, in our funding formulas. When looking at property tax, by way of example, with the proper passage of Prop 13 in the late 1970s, um, that 40-year-old formula now results in the county getting about $463 per unincorporated, rate, unincorporated resident in property tax revenue. As compared to our peers and statewide averages, uh, that's three times lower than the state average and nine times lower than our peer averages. Again, the counties around us and statewide receive a far greater share of property tax than we do in our county. And that's it's just a baked-in formula from the 1970s. There's no fault about it. It just is something that we have to deal with. Looking at um, our property tax trend, I mean, we'll talk about that sales tax underfunding in a subsequent presentation. When we started looking at our revenue trends, we are seeing positive growth and we are seeing recovery, as Carl's philosophy has pointed out. Uh, many of our revenues have recovered from the pre-pandemic drops. We still have gaps in those funding that we were unable to collect but the, the trends are, are showing some recovery. Now the slide above you that you're seeing here layers in our trend line that was the pre-pandemic 
actual intrinsic growth for property tax. That's the dotted line. So had pre-pandemic, had those growth levels continued, um, in the case of property tax, we would have had, we would be projecting $6.9 million more next year than what we're actually on pace to collect. Um, as a whole, when looking at the property tax, vehicle licensee, sales tax, and transit occupancy tax, kind of our big four revenue streams. On the whole, when we look at those four revenue streams, they're trended growth trends versus our projections. We're about 2.4 million short below our, our trending average. Um, property tax is, the, is by far the largest one that's short by 6.9 million. And it's not a deficit, we're seeing growth, but the growth is slower than it was the pre-pandemic levels. When looking at VLF as our second largest revenue source in general purpose revenues, uh, that is trending well, but not keeping pace with our pre-pandemic growth trends. That one is falling short about 2.1 million for next fiscal year. Sorry, I forgot to advance the slide there. Uh, so that's our VLF trend trend line as compared to our actual projection for next fiscal year. When looking at sales tax, that is the strong growth trend and far exceeding the historical averages. Uh, thanks in large part to the past to Measure G, the district tax is outperforming our Bradley Burns 1% base tax. And I'd love to have a study session on the nuances in that, but district taxes tend, in our case, tend to collect at a higher per capita rate than the base sales tax. On the whole, our total sales tax coming in for next fiscal year is projected to be 5.5 million ahead of the pre-pandemic trend levels. So that's great, but it's also a reflection of caution as our consumer economy is becoming heavier and heavier driven in consumer spending and retail. And in the last several years, um, consumers are dumping more money into tangible purchases. We do expect that trend to slow down. People will start going back to services, to experiences, and we are seeing some uh, of evolution of sales tax collection that we can talk about it uh, a little bit more later on. Um, now, while, again, while this is great news on the trend of our sales tax, there is a lot of caution in, in sales tax base as a whole. Concluding with the trend lines of transit occupancy tax, this one's very illustrative of the gap we saw at the, from the pandemic. You see a, a sharp decline in our 19, 20, 2019 and 2020 uh, collections. Now it has recovered from that pre-pandemic drop, um, but it's, it's, it's um, pace is exceeding what we were projecting on the actual trend level. And we're happy to see that on the whole, next year we expect to have 1.2 million more than we would, what we would have had from an actual trended level. I hope that makes sense to you. It's a different way of looking at some revenue trends, but I thought it was important to at least understand where we're seeing growth, but some of the growth isn't as great as we would like it to be. And there, I'll pause with just, there's a lot more detail in our major report. Um, I'll finish with another um, pure comparison of uh, systematic and funding, uh, our ARPA plan. You've seen a little bit about this last year in some of our ARPA reports, ARPA's American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, the allocation formula necessarily in our case didn't factor in the additional mandated obligation the county serves. When we looked at ARPA allocation within our county and compared it to a percent of general fund, uh, we were funded at 8.5% of our general fund. As compared to other cities and agencies around us, they were funded at least that level, if not substantially higher, it's not 45 to 47% of their general fund. So in another way, um, cities around us received, and some of our districts received a lot more in ARPA funding, but not necessarily with the mandated responses and costs that we had to incur in responding to the COVID pandemic. Um, that's just a matter of the formula and how it was created. Um, we're, we're grateful for the funding, but it, it, it is far insufficient to cover all of our extraordinary uh, COVID pandemic costs. Moving a little bit into, I wouldn't be a good budget officer if I weren't worried about some things. Um, this next slide just covers some big segments of, of future liabilities that we face. Um, while our capital improvement plan that was adopted for 2021-22 did provide detail on 301.7 million in unfunded unfunded projects. Um, we know there are more costs out there. We know that our facilities are aging faster than we like, and we know that there are costs that we're still trying to identify whether we are seeing big significant 
exposures in the next year, the next five years. That's going to be some work we're going to be doing over these coming years to make sure we're able to, to sustain our facilities and the services that um, are dependent on those facilities. In addition to capital and aging infrastructure investments, um, we've talked about this a lot and it was the nature of our February 1st board action. Thank you for that, of uh, pausing some of our ARPA funding. Um, we are facing upwards of $29 million in local costs our general fund might have to absorb from claims that FEMA will not reimburse, largely from the COVID pandemic, but also claims from the CCU fire emergency response. Again, we expect to have more detail on that uh, by April 26th. In addition, as we're looking down to a, a large community priority, um, the need to reduce the risk of or uh, help those who are experiencing homelessness, current estimates for countywide solutions total 34 to 44 million. That's not necessarily a county obligation, but we're certainly a partner in that, in those solutions. So there's some significant costs that our county um, is going to need to be a partner in or directly fund in these coming years that um, we're going to have to have some really strong strategies for. Um, again, were we funded in different levels or like our peers, we'd have a lot more options in, in, in providing solutions for these challenges. I'll conclude with recapping. Um, while this feels ominous, um, you know, I, I've been fortunate to work in this area in local government finance for nearly uh, two plus decades, and there are always solutions out there, and we will continue to come forward with solutions and opportunities. Um, our forecast is uh, forecasting gaps. We think those gaps are something to work towards, and we're going to continue to close those gaps. We have solutions in mind that will help close those gaps, um, but we are facing some considerable pressure and look forward to partnering with the board, um, with county department staff and with our community and solutions. Um, again, you'll, you'll hear us on April 26th with several items that will include an ARPA update, a FEMA claims risk update, an update on our reserves and some possible solutions to our budget gap. We'll also see much of this information discussed in our 22-23 proposed budget. Um, with that, I'm very thankful for the county board's leadership. I'm thankful for uh, County Office, Administrative Officer Palacios and his team there, uh, years of leadership and passion. I'm thankful for my predecessor, Christina Mowry, who was a, a, a great mentor in um, helping me on board here in the county. Um, with that, this concludes my presentation. You'll hear a little bit more of the storyline in our next agenda item. Um, but I'm certainly available for questions or comments. Thank you, Budget Manager Pimentel. Are there questions from members of the board? Yes, Mr. Chair, I have a brief one, if that's okay. Um, first, some appreciation on the presentation, uh, Mr. Pimentel, for your first full budget presentation. Um, I'd just like to say that I greatly appreciated the integration of the charts into the agenda report, as well as uh, breaking down the property tax take. We've always heard the percentage of 13%, but seeing it broken down to an actual dollar figure really, in my opinion, illustrates the inequities that Prop 13 uh, continues to create across the state. I did have uh, one question, which is in regards to the property tax lag. Um, you, you didn't necessarily provide a, a, a rationale as to what could be driving it. Is it just as simply the, the lack of property turnover in our region? It, I mean, obviously property values have gone up exponentially. So is it just the fact that there's there are no homes really turning over that's, that's leading in part to this uh, post-pandemic lag in our expectations under 6 million or so? Yeah, there's probably a couple factors. I'd say two of the obvious ones are we had a huge run up in, in transaction sales over the in, the in in the last five years and to a certain extent those can only go so far in a limited community so we, it could be just a, a trend of uh, uh, sales activity slowing down a little bit and the timetable it takes for supplemental changes to come on board and if a recent property tr transferred over in, in the last five or ten years that increase in property taxes is negligible um, certainly if a property was sold that that was came on the books in the 1970 assessed value and was sold in 2012, there's a huge gain in that. But if it sells again five years later, that, that new gain is pretty small. Um, we also had an impact on the CZU fire and we we're expecting and, and starting to receive some funding to help us with some of those assessed values that declined. Um, so those are probably two of the, the likely contributing factors to that. Um, to dive a little bit deeper, it would take a little bit more analysis and we'll do that in the mature, I mean, in the proposed budget. 
I appreciate those that. comments. Those are really good things to point out. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate this report. It's an outstanding report, and I just had that additional question just because I imagine it'll be something we'll be asked. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I thank you, uh, Mr. Pimentel, and to the piece uh, to the CAO for this mid-year report. I'm really fortunate to say the least that many of our revenues have bounced back after two years of unpredictability. Um, and as stated in the report, much rides on FEMA's decisions related to our reimbursement for them reimbursing us for the expenses incurred by sheltering and feeding our most vulnerable populations. Um, I do want to mention just that we adjusted the property tax um, uh, assessment for those uh, that were impacted by the fire, which was mentioned. So uh, we wanted that was something that we decided to do early on, and, and rightly so. I think it's also worth mentioning the impact of our decisions to contribute substantially to rescuing uh, Watsonville Hospital, uh, which benefits our entire county not just the South County. Um, it's, it's a big investment, but necessary for the future of our health. Um, one question, do, do these um, agreements or estimates take into account the fiscal impacts of our recent employee um, agreements that we just talked about earlier in the consent agenda? Uh, yes, uh, Board Member McPherson. Uh, these okay. do, we, we did include our estimated impacts or need to invest in our staff in, in, in these models. It's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Marcus, uh, for your report. Uh, one question I do have, I, I know, uh, you know, Santa Cruz County, uh, every county in California, 58 counties are unique. Uh, how are, uh, how is Santa Clara County? Do we have any idea how they're doing it? Uh, Monterey County, as far as their property tax and uh, revenue is going right now. A great question, uh, Board Member Caput. I, I, I will say, unfortunately, I, I don't have a, a good feeling on that. I know overall Santa Clara County is incredibly well funded. Um, when we look at their per capita numbers, they're one of the top funded counties in the state. Um, where their cost pressures are at and where, you know, if they're projecting deficits, I don't know that number, but I would, be, I would expect that they're, they've got a lot of opportunities and that they're not facing this, anything near the same challenges. Um, just in our conversations on the case of FEMA, for example, or for some from bigger counties, give us almost a shrug like, oh, well, we're, we're gonna deal with whatever FEMA does. We don't have that ability. Um, we must aggressively um, counter push against, push back against FEMA. As to Monterey County, is that something I could do a little bit more research and understand where they're at from a fiscal perspective? That's a great question. And then uh, a more of a comment rather than a question, but uh, uh, rather, you know, we, we need to be really proactive. If, if we get uh, uh, more property tax coming in now, and then uh, like Santa Clara County, maybe they're getting a lot more, but the thing is, if, uh, if all of a sudden the bubble pops and uh, we have uh, a crash like we did not, not that long, long ago with property taxes and, you know, homes uh, dropping in value. Are, are we kind of prepared for that uh, as a possible scenario? I, I like to be a little more proactive, a little more careful. We don't go out and spend all the money we got coming in and then all of a sudden we have another crisis. It's a great observation. I think our major report, um, I didn't cover that enough in this presentation, but our major report talks a little bit about kind of our perception of the recovery of the uh, economic um, slowdown that occurred. Um, technically, we ended a 10.7 year run of economic growth and we had a two month recession, one two months of recession. Um, I, I don't think that was a sufficient market correction. I'm very concerned that so much of our economy is based on consumer spending. And the minute, as we're seeing the spiral up of inflation, interest rates going up, and other risks with, with the retail industry, I think you're, you're, it's a good observation that uh, we're concerned about a, a possible economic slowdown in the next couple of years. Are we prepared? I think we've, we've done, this board has done a really phenomenal job in identifying uh, reserves and pre preserving them to keep us set up for emergencies such as uh, economic emergency or a 
climate-based um, uh, other emergency. But as we'll talk about in April 26th, um, when looking at all of our risks are county-based, economic and climate-based, our risks are pretty high. And I think there are a lot of us are really nervous that we don't have the bandwidth to really sustain another event in the coming years if FEMA is going to uh, be restrictive in, in their ability to help us. So I hope that doesn't over explain your question, but we're concerned about a pandemic, uh, an economic slowdown. And I don't, I think we're okay right now, but we, we need some, we need to be thoughtful of what's coming ahead. You bet. Then I guess uh, with the reserves uh, that we did have when we were having a lot of trouble, we had to, you know, dig into that quite a bit. Yep. Uh, I guess it'll be real important that we build that back up uh, so that we're always kind of ready for what's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, just a few questions. Um, the, uh, the report mentioned our self-insured liability fund. Is is that our fund that we use um, for when when people sue the county, or is that something else? Yes, that, that's it exactly. We, we do not purchase uh, third-party commercial insurance. Uh, we self-insure for all claims and liabilities. We have some minimum funding levels, but we have high-level exposure. Uh, so, yes, that is correct. Okay, got it. Um, and then I didn't realize how much uh, vehicle licensing fees actually contribute um, to our, our revenue stream. Um, and, and that's just when people actually purchase a car. It has nothing to do with vehicle registration. Yes and no. Um, a few, few governors ago, we had a movie star governor and they, they did the triple flip in the early 2000s, which is a very strange formula, but it ended up restructuring growth rates on vehicle licensing. So it's no longer tied to actual vehicle licensing trends. It's now tied to property tax growth trends. So when property tax is going really well, we're ahead of the game. And when it's, you know, as our recent years, maybe a little bit low, below average, we're not doing so well. So it, the base is still, you know, lives on uh, vehicle transactions, but the growth rates are, are now tied to property tax. Interesting. It's, it's, our, it, it's our, it's um, vehicle transaction. It's a share of vehicle transactions or like a some base rate that then every year is increased based on property tax values. Correct. Correct. Interesting. Okay. It's a very interesting model. There are a lot of interesting <laughs> financing models in the state. Yeah, which brings me to my, my last question, which is the allocation of online sales taxes. So is that is there actually a state law today that um, is determining how those are distributed or is it just an administrative change? I mean, what, you know, and of course, my, my real question is, how do we, what, what do we have to do to get that change? It's a great observation. Um, Federal Supreme Court, California Supreme Court, uh, California voters and California law and staff determination, all those drive um, the allocation formula. Most recently, as an example, uh, staff in the state of California have determined that certain warehousing companies, um, revenues that used to come to our county will now go revert back to where those warehouses are based. That was a recent change that happened in the last 12 months. Um, that's a significant hit to our sales tax base. On the whole, there is still archaic funding methodologies in the state constitution that when our residents in the unincorporated county purchase something online, those sales tax don't come directly to the county. They go into a pool shared across the entire county based on pro proportional shares of brick and mortar sales. So I don't mean to disparage Capitola that has malls and, and some auto, but they have a small population with a higher retail base. So they get a higher proportion of count unincorporated county online sales than we do because the allocation is based on brick and mortar sales tax. So there, there's some archaic funding methodologies that technology certainly can identify where that item was delivered, but um, the state still has to make those changes. And you know, I've been part of three rounds of those discussions at the state level and through the previous in the League of California cities. And it just ends up there's a lot of winners and losers and it gets very contentious. And anytime there's contention within the base, then the state, the state legislators typically don't want to touch that if, if the local government agencies can't get together. So it's a tough nut. It's a tough one to solve. But um, So you're saying we could, we're, unfortunately we're not going to be able to change those formulas uh, until the state constitution is changed. 
Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. All right. That's frustrating. Um, all right. Uh, any members of the public that wish to address us on this item? Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrenner. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Pimentel, thank you. You have explained some very confusing things very well, and I really appreciate it. I, I'm fascinated by this just explained issue of um, online sales tax and how it all gets distributed. And we really need to let the consumers know that because it gives us all the more reason to shop locally, doesn't it? And for us to support local retailers. I am very um, surprised by your report this morning. I thought had thought the county was in a pretty good shape with all of the incoming um, state and federal help. So I'm a little bit surprised by this. But I'm glad that you're on top of it, and I will look forward to your report on April 26th. I want to also um, echo Supervisor Caput's concern of the impending uh, 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 inf inf of the inflation we're experiencing now in a possible recession. And I know how long it took this county to pull out of that one the last time it happened. So I'm very concerned. I would like to know a dollar amount of how much the um, property tax by the CZU fire did affect the county's budget, a dollar amount. I know it's significant, but if you can report a dollar amount, that would be great. I would also ask that um, you give a dollar amount in terms of, you said that the count, this county's uh, reimbursement from the Rescue Act was only about 8.5% of the general fund. I have learned to regard percents with a, a note of caution. I like real figures. So how much did we actually get? And um, how has it been used? I am very upset still about Measure G sales tax. Thank you, Ms. The Steinberg. voters were promised that it would be used for fire. Zero. Any other members of the public that wish to address us? There are uh, no other speakers. Thank you. Seeing none, I'll return to the board for action. The motion would be in order. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. It was a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? I'll just uh, add a comment. Of course, I'll support uh, accepting the report today. Um, you know, and, and we'll move on to discuss some other potential revenue measures. But um, you know, fundamentally, we're we're going to have to be aligned in addressing these inequities in the property tax distribution and sales tax distribution. I mean. Our, our county continues to suffer from, um, from these rates. And, uh, and we, we have hundreds of millions of dollars in unfunded uh, road repairs, a hundred million dollars in unfunded park repairs. Um, you know, and as Supervisor McPherson mentioned earlier, we, we're, we're doing great things. We've, we've won some merit awards um, and, uh, and, and all on a very short, small budget. Uh, you know, we could accomplish so much more if we just got our fair share. Um, I mentioned some of these issues at a recent town hall uh, to some of my constituents and, um, you know, they were outraged and ready to take action. So I think the more we get this information out there, uh, the more aligned we get in, in changing it, um, the better off, better chance we'll, we'll stand of actually changing these issues. I mean, we just have no choice. I mean, some of these upcoming measures we're talking about, they'll help, but, um, you know, they're a drop in the, in the bucket and, and they can't fundamentally right the ship. Um, we're doing okay now, but I shudder to think what will happen uh, in the case of a serious recession. Oh, Mr. Chair, to, to, to build on that, I, one could submit that if we were receiving our fair share, these it would obviate the need for these, these, these measures that we're even discussing in the next couple of items. I mean, realistically, how often do you hear, all of us hear, I pay X number of dollars in property taxes, why don't I have, and then it'll be roads, public safety, parks, and why are you coming back? With additional, well, this is the rationale as, as to why every percentage point 
at, we're at 13, right? Every percentage point that we're able to keep equates to millions of dollars uh, that is actually now sent elsewhere as a result of or not uh, maintained in the unincorporated county. So I, I completely agree that the formulation, if there was a way to do it, because people are already spending that money here locally. And the reality is the money isn't necessarily staying locally. Some of it does go to special districts and other things locally, but disproportionately money is leaving. Um, and people feel that their investments that are being made through property taxes aren't being reinvested locally. And they're, they're correct because of the structural design. Thank you. Any further discussion? When we have a motion on the floor, clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Koenig. Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, that uh, mid-year budget report being accepted, we will move on to item eight, to consider a report on the county's transient occupancy tax in the unincorporated area, adopt resolution to provide for the submission of a countywide measure, increasing the transient occupancy tax to the qualified voters of the Santa, County of Santa Cruz at the regular election to be held on June 7th, 2022, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Dan, uh, I believe that County Budget Manager Marcus Pimentel will be presenting on this as well. Yes, and, and again, just confirming my first run in a virtual presentation. Can you see the screen that's up with the TOT measure? Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, I will be presenting with our Assistant County Administrative Officer, Nicole Coburn, uh, together with many other staff. We've been working on some solutions of how we might uh, start bridging some of our gaps and more importantly, how we can start addressing some of our funding issues. Um, so I appreciate uh, Nicole Coburn for joining us joining us here today. Um, I will turn it over to her to kind of set the stage for it. So Nicole, I presume you're here and ready to go. Yep, I am online. Thank you, Marcus. And good morning, boards, the board members. So um, why don't you go to the next slide, Marcus? So on today's presentation, um, we're going to be reviewing the results of our recent polling on community priorities. Uh, Marcus, you just heard a presentation from him on the mid-year budget. He's going to recap just a little bit about the county's financial status, particularly as it applies to our transient occupancy tax and cover some of our comparisons. Um, he's also going to cover some of our large financial liabilities, which you just heard a little bit about. And then we'll conclude with the recommendations um, to add a uh, measure to our June 7th, 2022 ballot regarding the transient occupancy tax. Next slide. So we did conduct some polling um, in the fall and one of the aspects of that polling identified some of our community uh, priorities. And as you can see here, we were encouraged to see alignment with what we believed are our top, top economic priorities. Um, and these are similar to some of our uh, prior polling that had been done. Um, the chart here is stacked based on the items that you can see had the greatest need, but also highlight items that felt um, that likely voters had some need for the county. So for example, if you look down towards the bottom of the chart where it says streets and roads, you can see that there was a combined great and some need at 82%. But um, the issues that really had the greatest need overall had to do with affordable housing, wildfire response and prevention and recovery, and mental health services and homelessness and affordable housing. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it back to Marcus. Um, we'll take it from here for a, few, a little bit. This is the part where if I recorded myself, I could just re repeat what I just presented to you, but we felt it was important to include this in the slide deck and also just refer to this just in case anybody from the community clicks in and just watches this segment. So I apologize for some of the redundancy um, from just a few minutes ago. But when we looked at our revised forecast in February, uh, this current year went from a, you know, a trended level that we thought was going to finish on balance to a deficit of 7.7 uh, 7 million as detailed in our mid-year report and the prior presentation. Some big components of that are, are stepping, the county stepping forward to help keep the Wasmo Community Hospital open with a $5 million pledge. Um, some changes in our uh, expectations on unreimbursed FEMA revenue and costs for a pandemic response and uh, shelter and care services. 
uh, we did see some positive growth in, in revenue trends and some budget savings. So on the whole, we ended this where we revised our forecast for a deficit this year of 7.7 .7 million, a structural imbalance that we plan to come back to the board by April 26th with a plan to how we might fix that should, should it remain. Um, I want to just kind of move on to not be entirely redundant, but just to know that these forecasts, there's a lot of work that goes into them. We revised the overall forecast trend in December and January, and we'll be providing some new detail in the February uh, proposed budget, the 22-23 proposed budget that we hope has some opportunities from the state budget with their large surplus. Taking a, another step forward from our prior conversation about systematic unfunding, um, as detailed in our mid-year report, this next slide kind of illustrates from a service perspective, um, not only are we systematically un un underfunded, um, we are also a county that does a lot more than most other counties. Um, when looked at our peers uh, and looked at us from a statewide comparison, we have more population served in our county than most other counties across the entire state. Um, so A, we're unfunded because of some historical 40-year-old funding formulas, and B, we happen to have more population that lives in, in the unincorporated area uh, as compared to our friends in Santa Clara who have um, phenomenal per capita county revenue bases. They only have 4%, just over 4% of their population lives in the unincorporated area. So the county of Santa Clara serves 4% of the population where the cities pick up nearly 96% of that. Uh, in our case, we, we, we were responsible for just, just over 50% of the population in our county directly. So we act as a municipality, we act as a county mandated service level. And in those mandates, we act as a, a delivery of services from the state that we're required to fund. Um, so we have a lot more obligations than our peers. Um, and with that systematic unfunding, it just puts a lot of cost pressures on us. As an example, um, this is a repeat of the slide on property tax. Again, we kept it in here just so it's, it's, it's visible, uh, but I don't want to uh, over stay my welcome on this one, but just in the end, when compared to our peers, we have we received proportionally a far greater uh, less in property tax revenue than our peers around us, either our county peers or across the entire state, three to, time, nine, three to, three to nine times um, less than our peers. When we look at sales tax, this slide is in our, 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 our major report to, to a certain extent. Um, we are also underfunded and under-resourced. And Chair Koenig, to your prior question and prior presentation about online sales tax, that's a big determination in this. Uh, a, counties typically are not the retail centers of your community. Typically, those are cities. And we we're typically would be a county would typically provide uh, county-wide services but also a lot of urban urban services in our county serving half the population um, you would expect that our sales tax would be greater but it's that formula and how sales tax is allocated especially online sales um, that that is to our disadvantage so when we look at us at, at, at statewide averages um, we're at 90 dollars per capita the statewide average is about 20 per capita and when we look at our local cities uh, they're nearly three times the per capita sales tax uh, receipts than we are. Um, so even at a sales tax level, we are hurt largely by the, the way online sales tax are allocated and the formulas behind there. Again, this is maybe just a different view, but that same recap of some of our major liabilities and our investments gaps and where our opportunities lie in the future. Um, the capital 2021-22 the CFP report detailed 317 301.7 million in unfunded capital projects. We know that number is larger. We know that we have aging facilities that are not adequately um, reviewed and that number is gonna grow as we start seeing more of those risk factors come into play. We know that we're, we have at least 29 million at risk from a local share that our general fund would be responsible for, AKA the FEMA would not reimburse from the CCU fire and the COVID pandemic. And we know that countywide collectively, our county is looking at numbers between 34 and 44 million to help with uh, those at risk of, of experiencing homelessness or those who are experiencing homelessness, how to mitigate that and how to provide solutions. So we know our needs are great. Um, we know we have brilliant and passionate people behind us to help provide the solutions, but our funding shortfalls are, are just something that are, are a struggle. So I pause.
love to catch my breath and make sure I'm not talking too fast. Um, one of the considerations we have before you today is to add to our June 7th ballot a ballot measure that would increase transit occupancy tax across the unincorporated county by 1% for hotels, motels, and inns, and 3% for visitors who choose to stay at a vacation rental property. Uh, again, these are taxes that are borne by the visitor when they choose to come here. Uh, they pay the tax and the local um, establishment, or in the case of a VRBO or Airbnb, they collect the tax on our behalf and remit it to us. Um, our county needs are great, and as identified by, uh, by Nicole Colburn previously, uh, our community polling kind of aligns with our own strategic initiatives and priorities. Uh, we have a need to invest in wildfire prevention and our emergency response. As we know, we have higher risk from climate climate impacted emergency events. We know our street repair is not where we'd like it to be. We know we need to invest proactively in public mental health and that in turn over time will reduce other costs the county has to uh, um, take on. And we know homelessness, um, the, the ability to um, mitigate those who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness is a huge social determinant of health that reduces our other costs on the tail end of a lot of our situation. So we, we hope to find some resources to start investing in these places and sustaining some of our services. And we think it's the right place to look to our visitors. Um, why we have a split rate, that's a great question. Uh, we've had some great community outreach with hotel, motel and operators and our vacation rental community to just listen and understand their concerns, but also for us to uh, have a conversation about what we see. And we see that there are a lot, the trend of vacation rentals in our community is increasing as it is in a lot of coastal communities. You can look to any of our neighbors uh, south a little bit and they're almost predominantly second home communities. Um, a lot of the, the graphic in this slide illustrates the red dot mapping of where our vacation rentals are in the unincorporated areas. And you see a lot of a lot of concentration in our coastal zones. That's also where a lot of our residential communities live. Um, there's a greater impact in what used to be a residential home now turning into commercial property. A, they didn't pay fees related to a commercial property service. And B, the impacts on the neighborhoods are, are great when, when people are trying to raise a family or, or have a peaceful living and they have a routine change in who's staying next door. Um, so for that reason, we feel it's appropriate for our visitors who are impacting those neighborhoods who are impacting our residential housing stock to bear a greater share of helping us provide solutions. So that's why we were proposing the split rate at 12 and 14%. What that would do in our market is it puts us, it keeps us on par with where our region is. When we look at communities, the coastal zone communities, they're essentially at 12%, if not higher, just in our region. Um, yes, there are some agencies built below us at, at below our current 11% rate, um, but outside of the city of Santa Cruz, um, everyone with the coastal zone is at a higher transit oxygen tax rate. Again, those taxes are paid by visitors who come to this community. So we feel this recommendation keeps us in line with the market and does not um, put us at a competitive disadvantage locally. So I'm going to, like I mentioned, we did do polling in the fall regarding um, a potential measure related to the transient occupancy tax. Um, we did poll at the 1% increase for hotels, motels, and inns, and the 3% increase for vacation rental properties. And the polling results came back overwhelmingly in support of the ballot measure at 74%, as you can see here. Um, based on the poll results that we received, one of the most popular justifications was that the tax is being paid by visitors and just the overall impacts. Um, especially related to vacation rentals on our neighborhoods. Next slide, Marcus. So here you can see the ballot question that we're proposing to the board. Um, this is what we also pulled on. Um, I'm not gonna read it for you, but you can see that it includes the split rate for the hotels, motels and inns and vacation rentals increasing from 12 to percent or 14 percent respectively. Um, I will note that the revenue uh, measure would raise approximately 2.3 million dollars um, annually until ended by voters. Um, and with that, I think we have 
the recommended actions for you, which are to accept and file this report and then to take the various recommendations to place the measure on the ballot, um, including advising county council and the auditor controller tracts collector of the requirements for independent analysis and submitting the resolution to the county clerk um, by the deadline of March 11th. Our office would return to the board if the ballot measure is successful with any necessary actions. Uh, with that, Marcus and I are happy to take your questions. Thank you, Assistant CAO Coburn and Budget Manager Pimentel. Questions for members of the board, uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I can support uh, this increase. Um, it keeps us in line with other markets and it's largely supported by our residents, about three quarters of them. At, uh, from the polling of last fall. Uh, the estimate for the income, the revenue that would come from this, would it be, I think it's the total of 2.3 million. Is that correct? It is, that is correct, Chairman, or uh, Supervisor McPherson. Okay. Um, you know, as a member of the Visit Santa Cruz County Board, I know it's important to recognize uh, that this tax is paid by visitors to our community. Um, and while their tourism is critical to keeping uh, sales tax revenues healthy, I, I think it's been proven that the TOT or transit occupancy tax is not a deterrent to people choosing to come to Santa Cruz County to stay overnight. Uh, so I, I will support this and would be glad to make the motion to do so when it's appropriate. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? I have a couple of questions, but I don't believe that um, that uh, other of our, our staff members on, on the line can answer them. If you can, feel free to jump in. But you know, I've I've heard that our uh, tax collector's office has uh, what's called host uh, compliance software, but our planning department does not, which oversees the vacation rental permits. Is is that? Does anyone know if that's true? I do, I, I, you're correct that um, uh, the Auditor Controller's Office has the host compliance. I think it goes by a new name now. I can't speak to what planning does or does not uh, utilize as part of its permitting process. Um, but if, if staff aren't on the line, we're happy to get back to you with the answer, Chair Koenig. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I, I've also received some um, complaints from constituents that the Citizen Connect app is not up to date with um, the most recent uh, approved vacation rentals. I uh, don't know if anyone knows the last time that it was actually updated. Um, I, we can check with the information services department. Um, occasionally they do, they might do refreshes as part of the app, but we can check with them on the last time that was updated. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, my, my point here is, um, you know, I'm certainly supportive of the, the idea of increasing the TOT. Most of the constituents I've talked to are also supportive of the idea. And, um, you know, on the one hand, there's there's some pretty clear justifications, particularly for the higher rate for vacation rentals, that it, there is a higher burden of enforcement um, and that many of these vacation rentals are operating as a commercial business in residential areas and, and never paid impact fees. Um, so that's, that's a great justification. But on the other side, when we look at the needs where, um, you know, the, in our county budget, um, $7.7 .7 million shortfall this year, and this will only provide 2.3 of additional funding. You know, my concern is that rather than beef up regulation or, um, you know, do some of those neighborhood projects where people will start to feel like maybe there was a fair shake on vacation rentals, um, instead the, the funds will get sucked uh, just into meeting the basic needs of our county budget. And, um, you know, I'll just add that in Monterey, the city of Monterey, for example, yes, they're at 12% today, um, but they also have um, an additional measure that says 16% of all TOT taxes will go to uh, neighborhood recommended projects. And again, this is a way um, that the funds and that are coming from vacation rentals and that, um, which impact neighborhoods are going back into those neighborhoods and uh, helping to support uh, citizen proposed projects. So and if you look at um, what 16% of our TOT would be, it was, it's actually right around $2.5 million. So, you know, essentially all of this increase. Um, so I'll just say, I think that it wouldn't be appropriate at this time, but I think in the future, we uh, are gonna need to look at doing some kind of budget resolution if this passes, if voters approve it, um, 
that uh, it directs some of the, the funds from TOT uh, back to addressing uh, these concerns around vacation rental regulations and uh, neighborhood impacts. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, my question, uh, this impacts uh, uh, more of the, uh, the other four districts of Santa Cruz County, uh, more than uh, South County. Uh, because of uh, we don't have a whole lot of uh, vacation rentals in District uh, Four, and uh, so I guess uh, I, uh, the one concern I had years ago, I did have the uh, uh, Pajaro Dunes area, and uh, what are we raising the vacation rental from? Uh, what percent to fourteen uh, percent? What, what is it currently right now? I'm, uh, I should know the answer to that. Uh, we're, we're at 11%. Oh, go ahead, Marcus. We're at 11% now. Yeah. So that's a, that's a 3% three, a 3 raise in the, uh, is that, is that going to be a big, uh, a big deal or what? I don't know. It is your data, doesn't it? It should not be a big deal. Typically, visitors who pay the tax don't decide where to go based on the tax rates. Um, we are a very attractive area, so their decisions are something else. So when they pay the tax rate, it shouldn't impact um, where they're choosing to go. Okay. So if the rest of the board is uh, basically for it, uh, I'll, I'll go along. I, uh, like I said, it's not uh, a big deal in uh, uh, the Watsonville area as far as vacation rentals. but. Uh, my only concern is for the rest of the county. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Any other questions from members of the board? Then we'll take it to the public. Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for this um, interesting report. Um, I, I want to thank Supervisor Koenig for bringing up the possibility, and I think it should be done in the ballot language itself to build in that a certain percent of this new tax revenue will be used for neighborhood recommended projects. I'm appalled to see that in the language of this ballot, the first thing on there is wildfire prevention. And the second thing is emergency response. The third thing is street repair. These are the same issues that Measure G ballot language had in 2018 that was put through in the November time when the fires were happening. And zero of Measure G half cent sales tax has gone to fund fire protection. What guarantees can you give the public that this will not be a repeat of that? In order to build public trust that this money will in fact go to wildfire protection, emergency response, and street repair, I want to see some percentages of the expected revenue dedicated to going to those funds. Otherwise, I have no confidence that it will actually happen. This will be a complete repeat of what happened with Measure G in 2018, and there is no citizen oversight of that, as was promised. Ms. Driscoll simply said, well, it's on the website and people can look at it. That is not citizen oversight. So if you want the public's trust in this, you need to build in these percentages, just like you did with Measure D. And I ask that that happen before your board approves anything moving forward on this. $2.3 million is a lot of money, and the public wants to know how it's going to be spent and have some assurance it will be spent. In there are no other speakers to uh, comment. Thank you. Then I'll return to the board for action. A motion would be in order. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. 
Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? I think the only thing I'd add is, uh, and it's been said in both the previous item and this item is, uh, you know, we are facing so many uncertainties and we've seen in the last two years where we needed to have either reserves to whether a pandemic or fires uh, or FEMA reimbursement or the closure of a hospital. I mean, the reality is our world's becoming uh, much more complex. And while the county is looking at resilience from an infrastructure point of view, it's also frankly important that we are resilient from a financial point of view to be able to respond to emerging needs that will be uh, occurring on a much more regular basis. And, you know, building in um, some, some of these taxes that can, uh, that can provide that resilience in our budget to respond to these needs, I think is important. Um, and especially when it's uh, primarily gonna fall on people who come and enjoy our community, right? enjoy the resources and quality of life of our community, um, they need to contribute to maintaining that. And so, uh, so that's why I'm supportive today. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? I would just add, um, it, you know, I agree with the sentiment uh, of the of the caller. And as I've said, I think that ultimately, uh, you know, some portion of of these revenues should be uh, allocated um, to reduce neighborhood impacts and, and neighborhood projects and regulation. Um, you know, if we were to build that into the initiative language, um, first of all, it would make it a special tax. It would increase um, the threshold that it would need in order to pass from 50% plus one uh, up to a two thirds vote. Um, and second, it would really reduce our flexibility as Supervisor Coonerty said. I mean, um, you know, one of the big challenges we, we, we discussed earlier in terms of um, the, the very low rate that we get from our property taxes, that was baked into Prop 13. And, and as a result, it's incredibly difficult to change. And so um, rather than having those rates fixed in uh, an initiative passed by voters, um, it gives us just a, a little bit more um, flexibility and ability to respond to the needs of the day if it's um, something that we address through a budget resolution in the future. Um, I do plan to work on that and uh, bring it forward if this measure passes. So uh, if there's no further comment, uh, clerk, please roll call vote. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, that um, increase in the TOT will be submitted to uh, voters on the June 7th uh, ballot this year. We will now move to item eight, consider a report on the county's, or sorry, item nine, consider an update on proceeding with a protest vote for a recycling and solid waste infrastructure charge to fund the county solid waste facilities, accept and file report on community support for allowing the county to collect a percentage of single use cup and single use bag charge fees and direct the Department of Public Works to return on April 12th, 2022 to present recycling and solid waste infrastructure charges and initiate related Proposition 218 proceedings as outlined in the memorandum of the WDCAO Director of Public Works. And for a report on this item, we have Kent Edler, Assistant Director of Public Works Special Services. Thank you, uh, Chair Koenig and Supervisors. Um, I'm Kent Edler, Assistant Director of Public Works in the Community Development and Infrastructure Department. Um, I'd also like to ask if the Clerk of the Board can promote Casey Colossa and Bo Hawksford um, as presenters. So at the September 28th, 2021 board meeting, we were given direction to return with an update regarding a recycling and solid waste charge to fund county recycling and solid waste facilities. Additionally, we are also returning with a report on community support for allowing the county to collect a percentage of single use cup and single use bag charge fees. We've done quite a bit of outreach on both items since September, which I'll be going over in this presentation. So I'll start with their recycling and solid waste infrastructure charge. So as discussed back in September, the Buena Vista landfill is nearing capacity and we have already begun the planning for the eventual closure and transition of the site to a transfer station. A recent evaluation was completed two weeks ago and there is as little as eight years remaining. 
However, siting of the transfer station will further reduce the years left in the, at the landfill. So a more realistic timeline or time frame for closure is in the six to eight year range, which makes the need for transfer station more urgent. Due to SB 1383, organics such as food waste need to be removed from the normal waste stream. So we're also working on planning an organics processing facility at the Buena Vista landfill. In addition to the needs at the Buena Vista landfill, the Ben Lomond transfer station is nearly 30 years old and in need of improvements and maintenance. We've estimated the total of these improvements to be on the order of $55 million. Currently, the Recycling and Solid Waste Division has an existing 9C assessment, which was put in place in 1982, which helps fund operations and maintenance of the Buena Vista landfill and the Ben Lomond Transfer Station. The charge of $56.94 per parcel has remained unchanged for several decades, so the funds don't go as far as they once did. We've been working with our consultant HF&H to develop a new recycling and solid waste infrastructure charge, which would fund the new transfer station and compost facility, as well as the related operations. The preliminary estimate for the new charge is about $110 annually per parcel in the unincorporated county. However, we've been working with our consultant on fine tuning the amounts and feel that that number will actually come in a bit lower. Probolsky Research conducted two focus groups in the community regarding this charge, where they presented the issue and need for the transfer station and the compost facility. The re results were positive and there was unanimous support for the facilities and most felt the $110 annual charge was reasonable. Probolsky Research also conducted a survey of 400 residents throughout the county and presented them with the issues surrounding recycling solid waste as well as the estimated $110 annual charge. Approximately 56% of those surveyed support the building of the transfer station and organics facility. 19% were opposed and approximately 26% were undecided. The new recycling and solid waste charge would be a Proposition 218 protest vote, meaning that the charge would pass if there was not a majority protest of all affected property owners. Given the needs of the Given the needs of the at the Buena Vista landfill and the results of the surveyor, we are recommending to come back in April to present the charges and initiate the Prop 218 proceedings. So moving on to the next topic, which is the single use cup and bag ballot measure research. Currently, there is an ordinance in place, although it's delayed until July 1st, which requires businesses to charge customers in unincorporated county 25 cents per, per each single use disposable cup. There's also an existing ordinance that requires customers to pay 25 cents per single use carry out bag. We enlisted a firm called TBWBH Props and Measures to evaluate a potential ballot measure to split a portion of the 25 cent charge and conduct research. After removing data regarding revenue generated and the experience and their experience in the community, they recommended that we concentrate only on splitting the single use cup charge fee, which would be half to the county and then half to the businesses. So the consultant used FM3 research to survey the community about a potential ballot measure that would split the 25 cent charge in order to fund the programs. They surveyed um, 600 residents. To, and th they discuss programs such as reducing um, pollution, trash, and plastics from entering local waterways, coastal waters, and beaches, protecting water quality, uh, address illegal dumping, helping to prevent wildfires, providing environmental education, and also providing clean and well-maintained parks and public areas. The results of the survey indicated that 66% of likely voters support such a measure. Additionally, Nicole Coburn from the County Administrative Office and I met with representatives from the local business community, which are listed on this slide, and we wanted to gather their input as well. So input received from the business community um, includes items such as, or uh, comments such as that the measure to protect the environment aligns with the goals and values of the businesses. Um, some of them felt that the businesses would be on board, especially since they can retain some of the charge. Several thought it would be a good idea to have signage developed that would help explain to patrons that the charge helps fund environmental programs. Also, there were some suggestions that they wanted to ensure that the money um, gets used for the intended environmental programs. 
And there were also some concerns regarding businesses operating in multiple jurisdictions, as well as some questions about administration of the program. Overall, the outreach from the community in general, as well as the business community was positive. And item 10 on today's agenda, which is the next item, is where the board would consider a resolution for the submission of a countywide measure regarding this single use disposable cup tax. So the recommended actions are to consider, consider this update on proceeding with a protest vote for a recycling and solid waste infrastructure charge to fund the county solid waste facilities, accept and follow report on community support for allowing the county to collect a percentage of the single use cup and single use bag charge fees and direct public works to return by April 12th, 2022 to present recycling and solid waste infrastructure charges and initiate the Prop 218 proceedings. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you for that report. Are there questions from members of the board? Seeing none, we'll open it for public comment. Are there any members of the public that wish to comment on this item? In user two, your microphone is available. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and um, I have before me a publication from your county, um, Zero Waste News for the County of Santa Cruz Green Waste Recovery for Winter 2021. And what you're talking about is wholly inadequate to deal with the problem. And here's what it states, and there's quite a visual of tons of plastic. Plastic plague, COVID-19 unleashed a tidal wave of plastic waste ordered by your county, right? to use all this plastic. The coronavirus pandemic has brought an increase in the use of plastic, the main component in masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, water bottles, and takeout food packaging. It seems to me that if the mandates are listed for this, uh, mandating more toxic waste, in reality, we would be a whole lot better off. It says, oh, deep worry, this is your publication, is that COVID-19 has reversed the momentum of a years long global battle to reduce single use plastic and has created an excuse to revert to using plastic for everything. This was the case when Governor Gavin Newsom temporarily lifted a ban on single-use grocery bags over concerns the virus could be transmitted via contact tree reusable bags. Medical experts believe reusable materials pose no additional risk. Anyway, it goes on. So you are, in your policies, promoting enormous more plastic and on the other hand have this item on the agenda there's a contradiction here we need to stop production at its source thank you there are no other speakers for public comment thank you then i'll return it to the board for action a motion will be in order, Supervisor McFarland. Move for approval. I'll second that. I, I just I want to make that's fine. Um, I just want to make a comment though. Um, I, thanks, Public Works, for bringing this item, and I don't understand quite the logic. I think that you know uh, stopping this at the source is uh, that's a big order, larger than Santa Cruz County uh, can do by itself. But what we can do is be a leader as we have been uh, for years and years in the pro-environmental waste management efforts through 
these single use ordinances. And, and we have a responsibility as stewards of the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary, I believe, uh, to address uh, the impacts of these plastic bags, paper cups, and avoidable uh, litter in our waste stream. So I'm supportive of our goals to address the future planning for the Ben Lomond Transfer Station and Buena, uh, Vista Landfill, which has gone on for years. And I'm glad to see the point indicates that um, our community supports these efforts. So I think we're doing what we can at Santa Cruz County. And I think this is a good step forward and I'm supportive of the recommended actions. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. So we have a motion by Supervisor Caput and a second by Supervisor McPherson to approve the recommended actions. Uh, is there any further discussion? <laughs> I'll just add uh, that, to, you know, again, appreciation to Assistant Director Adler for the report. Uh, and of course, we'll be talking more about the single use uh, cup charge in our next item. Uh, as far as the protest vote for uh, improving our waste facilities, I mean, I too am glad to see that the polling indicates the public recognizes the need to upgrade our essential waste uh, processing facilities. Uh, we'll just say these sorts of can be controversial. People feel that if you know they miss the miss the notice that the vote is happening or their opportunity to protest, uh, and all of a sudden see their rates increase, um, they can feel like you know there was a. a Typically, it can, can generate concerns that this was an undemocratic process. I mean, of course, this is a, an approved process, but nevertheless, we want to make sure people are duly notified. Um, so I hope that when, you know, of course, we're not approving a protest vote today, but when you come back on April 12th, um, if we do choose to proceed, I would hope that we would have some sense of what the mailings would look like so that we can also notify constituents um, of that, that this could be moving forward. So if there's no further discussion, clerk, uh, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. All right, that uh, report being accepted and filed and uh, Public Works will return on April 12th to present um, more information about a protest vote. We'll now move to item 10 to consider resolution to provide for the submission of a countywide measure establishing a single use disposable cup tax to the qualified voters of this county of Santa Cruz at the regular election to be held on June 7th, 2022. And take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And for a report on this item, um, we have assistant CAO, Nicole Coburn. Thank you, Chair Koenig. Um, I assume you're seeing the screen right now. We are, thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO. I'm joined today by Ken Edler, the Assistant Director of Public Works as well. Together, we're going to present to you on our proposed single use cup tax ballot measure for the June 2022 uh, regular election. So today we're going to cover a few areas. Um, we're going to, I'm going to have Kent go over the problem uh, related to too much trash uh, in the county. And then we'll just briefly touch on the current disposable cut ordinance, as well as the delayed implementation that you heard about in the last presentation. We'll uh, present to you the proposed measure and the results of the polling that we conducted in the fall, and then we'll outline our recommended actions. So with that, I'm going to have talk about, uh, have Kent talk about trash. So as discussed in the previous agenda item, um, within this next six to eight years, the landfill is expected to meet, reach uh, maximum capacity and close. Um, and the trash problem continues to worsen, but the county is, you know, we're working, we're, we're working to do everything possible we can to reduce waste and increase the lifespan at the landfill. Um, every year it's estimated that there's over 5 million single use cups that get used and thrown away in this county alone. Um, in recent years, there's been more litter on beaches and trash and trash cans, um, and they're overflowing, leading to litter on our roads and in our waterways. A large source of this trash includes single-use items that often end up in our creeks, streams, and other local waterways, which release toxins into our local groundwater and water supply. Uh, next slide, please. In 2019, the uh, Santa Cruz County passed a single-use cup charge for of 25 cents for each cup. 
that the measure seeks to reduce litter, waste, and pollution. It applies to any single-use cup provided by a business in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. Um, it does not apply to, to any of the cities. Next slide. Uh, due to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic, implementation of this charge was delayed. It was delayed to safety concerns and also concerns around negative impacts to already struggling businesses. The fee currently is scheduled to go into place on July 1st, 2022. And I will hand it back over to Nicole. Thank you, Ken. So as Ken previewed in the last presentation, we have our existing 25 cent disposable cup charge of 25 cents. Um, we're proposing to build on that ordinance and staff are recommending a measure that would allow the county to tax half of that charge um, and we would allow businesses to retain the other half to help defray the cost of implementation. So you can see the, the charge here being split. So the ballot question that we polled on in the fall um, can be shown here. Um, as seen here, the proposed measure would allow the county to tax um, 12 and a half cents of the existing single use cup charge. This, this measure would raise approximately $700,000 annually. Um, the revenue would be used on waste reduction and environmental programs, among other governmental purposes. Um, we would be using this to uh, fund programs such as protecting clean drinking water sources, water quality and marine life, reducing pollution, trash and plastics, entering local waters and beaches, helping prevent wildfires, cleaning up trash and litter, including in storm drains, streets, and public areas, as well as cleaning and maintaining local beaches, parks, and natural areas. If passed by voters, the single-use cup tax would take effect on January 1st of 2023, pursuant to the draft ordinance that we included as part of the board uh, item. And really this uh, delayed implementation allows us to develop the administrative pr provisions for collecting and remitting the tax um, from businesses. We're also, um, as part of this measure, of course, um, we would ensure public disclosure of all spending. All of the funds would remain local to Santa Cruz County. And we would be reporting on the use of these funds as part of our annual auditing process or comprehensive financial audits through our auditor controller's office, as well as all of our public budget reports that we go through every year as part of our comprehensive budget process. So in the fall, when we pulled on this potential measure, 66% um, of likely voters for the June election were supportive of the measure. Um, there is um, that's initially strong support with four in 10 saying that they would definitely vote yes for the measure. Per the polling, the top priorities were uh, protecting water, marine life and beaches, as well as helping fund wildfire protection and generally protecting public health. So our recommendations for the board today are similar to our other ballot measure, adopting the resolution calling for the election of the single use disposable cup tax, advising um, the, the appropriate offices of the requirements for independent analysis, directing the clerk of the board to submit the resolution to the county clerk by the deadline of March 11th. And then our office would return after the election with any necessary actions should the tax be authorized. And with that, um, Kent and I are happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Assistant CAO Coburn. Are there questions from members of the board? Yes, Mr. Chair, I don't really have a question, but as first I wanted to appreciate the work, not just the staff, but of the board for sticking uh, with me. I've been a bit dogmatic on wanting this to come forward uh, for the last couple of years, because as I've said previously, I, I think that most people that that pay these single use fees believe that the money does go back to the local jurisdiction for programs exactly like this. And I think would be surprised to learn that that's not the case. I do appreciate though, that there were comments made by uh, my colleagues previously about some of the, the burdens of administration disproportionately on small businesses. And so I think that, that coming up with this ability to split it really does address both of those issues. One, it creates a new revenue stream uh, quite frankly, on, on the same types of materials that are causing the damage within our, our parks and, and our ocean area anyway, 
And two, it ensures that that uh, that there's uh, more money provided to the small businesses than there would cost in administration. So it seems like the right thing to do. There's no question that Public Works and others uh, could use additional funding in regards to uh, wildfire resilience, pollution control. Uh, we, we had a previous item actually on regarding syringe litter as well and, and an update regarding uh, how to report that kind of uh, stuff through our mobile app. And these are all things that don't have a dedicated funding stream. This would allow for a new significant funding stream to help address some of these issues throughout our community. So again, I appreciate not just staff, but, but the board sticking with me on, on this item over the last couple of years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Friend. Any other questions from members of the board? Seeing none, we'll take it to the public for any comment. One speaker, as a reminder, public comment is two minutes and your microphone will be muted automatically at the end of your time. Call in user two, your microphone is available. Marilyn Garrett, I see this as a drop in the bucket, and it's a myth of resolving the huge problem of the plastic plague, the microplastic, oceans of plastic, and plastic doesn't decompose. You have all these microplastics in our bodies and the environment. Um, I think this actually promotes the use of plastic because the message is keep using it, keep producing it, just pay a little extra to do it. It really needs to stop at the source and that's the production and the petrochemical production. But since corporations rule and contaminate us with their plastic and pesticides and cell phones, uh, nothing meaningful is really being done. I believe your words sound good, but they're deceptive. And Supervisor Friend talks about a mobile app. Um, that's more biologically harmful radiation. And there's so many cell phones that are in the plastic waste in the landfill fills. So I am against this. And also you put you mentioned the administrative burden on small businesses. There's already burdens on small businesses that are hardly surviving. So I vote no on this. I do not want to support these corporations producing this by our taxpayer money being good Samaritans trying to clean up the gargantuan piles of plastic put out there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seeing there are no now. other speakers. Thank you. Then we'll return it to the board for action. A motion will be in order. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend. Uh, second, was that uh, Supervisor Coonerty? McPherson. I think it was McPherson. All right, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? I'll just add that um, you know, this, it's a great, uh, if, if voters choose to pass this, it could be a great opportunity to uh, have some additional funding to address this um, huge waste problem that we're seeing. And, um, you know, one great candidate, I think, for a program that we could fund with this would actually be a, a reusable cup program. Um, things like Vessel, which was launched in the city of Berkeley, um, or, you know, it basically it would allow multiple restaurants to use the same type of uh, uh, takeout cup, and then it could be dropped off at any of those restaurants um, or even some other uh, the facilities placed around the county. Um, of course, the challenge there would be that we wouldn't uh, would then directly undercut the funding stream. Maybe we would try to launch it uh, within cities or work with cities uh, to do that. Um, and find a way to have the greatest impact. But um, I, I, you know, despite what the speaker's um, public comment said, uh, I think that there are real opportunities to directly address the issue uh, with some of these funds. 
So if there's no further discussion, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. <laughs> yeah, that uh, single-use cup charge will be submitted to the voters on the June 7th ballot. Next, we will move to item 11. Consider approval and concept of ordinance amending section 14 0.01.511 of the Santa Cruz County Code and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on March 8th, 2022, as outlined in the mem memorandum of Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor McPherson. And I can present a few short slides on this if the clerk could bring up the slides. Great, thank you. So uh, I think, as I said, um, this is a con consider approval and concept of ordinance amending section 14.01.511 of the Santa Cruz County Code, which relates to security, bonds, and deposits. Uh, another way to understand this might be how we make housing more affordable, one sidewalk and one storm drain at a time. Next slide, please. So the issue here is uh, that when developers uh, set out to start a project, we require them um, to, uh, to submit financial guarantees or securities to ensure that uh, they finish what they start, particularly when it relates to public infrastructure like sidewalks or storm drains. And state government code 66499 gives us a menu of financial security options that we can accept, including a bond, deposit, instrument of credit, lien upon the property to be divided, or a security interest in real property. Next slide, please. Uh, the problem is today that um, the menu or the options that we have selected um, do not um, do not include some some pretty basic ones, including bonds. So our current county ordinance prohibits a developer from using surety bonds issued after June thirtieth, two thousand and thirteen. Uh, the ordinance was last amended in two thousand and ten, and so we had a three year sort of trial period after which uh, bonds were no longer expressly uh, allowed. And we, even though um, there was no problem with that program, we have never updated the code. And so technically under county code, uh, bonds are not allowed, um, although our department does uh, occasionally accept them anyway. Um, so, you know, and of course, not all uh, financial securities are, um, are created equal. Some are more expensive than others. And so if we don't allow some of the more affordable options, uh, then effectively the financing of to, to build sidewalks and storm drains becomes more expensive, adding costs uh, to construction and ultimately to the cost of housing. And I'll just say that um, the way this came to my attention was uh, a small home builder uh, trying to get one of these financial securities so that they could proceed with building about 15 homes. Um, they were limited in their options and, um, you know, we're seeing risk to the project uh, because they, they couldn't get an affordable financial security. Next slide, please. The solution here is pretty simple. Uh, update our code to allow for uh, several more options, including bond uh, or multiple bonds, a deposit, an instrument of credit, a letter of credit, or any combination of the above. And again, having these more affordable options will allow us to uh, build more affordable housing in our community. Next slide. So the recommended actions are to consider approval and concept of ordinance amending section 14.01.511 of the Santa Cruz County Code and schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption on March 8th, 2022. Next slide. Any questions for members of the board? Yes, Supervisor McPherson. No, I just want to thank you and uh, partner with my office on this item. I think it's one more example um, of the actions the county can take to remove obstacles in building housing, which is sorely needed in this county. Uh, my thanks for uh, Public Works, as you mentioned, for calling attention to this item with our offices. So appreciate it very much. I uh, think it'll, our help, it'll uh, improve our efforts to build more housing in Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Any other questions from members of the board? Seeing none, uh, is there anyone in the public that would like to comment on this item? There are currently no speakers. 
Seeing none, we'll return to the board for action. A motion would be in order. I so move. Move the recommended actions. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Tony. Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, that motion will pass. Our bond ordinance will be updated. Uh, moving to item number 12, consider approval and concept of ordinance of the Board of Supervisors to the County of Santa Cruz amending Santa Cruz County Code section. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, item 12 was removed from the agenda. We'll move now to item 13 to consider approval and concept of ordinance adding chapter 2.29 to the Santa Cruz County Code to regulate the post-employment lobbying activities of former county officials and employees, schedule the ordinance for final adoption on March 8th, 2022, and direct the personnel department to notify current and future county officials and employees about the adopted ordinance as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Friend, did you want to Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity and thank the board for the consideration of this item. As uh, many of you know, because we're experiencing it on a, on a daily basis, the overall trust in institutions, especially at the national level and government being at the forefront of this has been eroding um, over the last couple of decades and even more so in the last few years. My sense is that the one place where people still feel that they have access is at the local government level, as even evidenced by those that came to petition earlier this morning that there's still an opportunity for a voice to be heard and there's a uh, you know, transparency and accountability that doesn't exist at either the state or national level. I was surprised to actually learn that, that the county doesn't have an ordinance like this already in place. I think that, that this provides another guardrail, another element of transparency of ensuring that those that work on behalf of the, of the common good and the public interest, creating maybe a regulatory structure, working on certain ordinances, maybe even just have access to relationships the general public does not have, that, that they're continuing to work within the public interest when they're designing those ordinances or working on those regulatory structures. So this provides an additional guardrail for a one-year cooling off period uh, post-employment to help ensure that when people are working on these processes that uh, it's continued to do within the public interest. I'm happy to take any questions uh, from my colleagues on this item. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Any question from other members of the board? Seeing none, we'll open it for public comment. Any members of the public would like to address us on this item? Call on user two, your microphone is available. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett. And it sounds like an important um, addition to the county code because we know there's a revolving door that goes from government to representing the corporations that the government's supposed to keep a lid on and then people come back to the government, et cetera. Uh, so this sounds like uh, something that's needed. And then I have a question regarding um, a person right now who used to work for the county, and I don't know the details of this, that Mimi Hall is working for this, what you discussed earlier, Pajaro Valley Hospital, something nonprofit. Maybe you could elaborate on that. And it sounded to me like this is a, a case in point. And I also remember having attended board meetings over the years and opposing all these cell towers. There was someone who worked in the planning department. I can picture him, but can't think of his name. And then at one of these uh, hearings for Verizon to get a cell tower, this person from the county was representing Verizon to obtain a cell site. And I think that's a case in point. I wonder how often that happens in our own county. It's very, very disturbing to me that government that's supposed to represent the people is representing corporate interests. 
above the public well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Yes. Seeing, there are other speakers. seeing no other speakers, uh, we'll return it to the board for action. A motion would be in order. Sure, and let me just briefly address, although we don't commonly do this, just some of the concerns that were raised up. Director, former Director Hall is working on a volunteer basis for what would be another public entity, i.e. a health district. The, this proposed change specifically exempts anybody that is working for another public entity is unpaid or that the county specifically seeks their expert advice in. Um, we're, we owe her an, an immense amount of gratitude for the, the hundreds and hundreds of hours that she's volunteering in order to bring that health equity to South County. Uh, in the latter example you provide, that's, um, while I'm not familiar with the specific example, that it, if as described, that would be precluded under the new ordinance of an employee that helped uh, draft ordinances regarding, say, cell uh, tower sightings within the county and then went to work for a company that was lobbying the county for for 12 months so that would be something that would be precluded so uh, mr chair i'll move the recommended actions motion oh. by second thank you which my supervisor friend second by supervisor mcpherson uh, additional thank you for the clarification supervisor friend is there any further discussion Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, that motion or that um, additional ordinance regulating the post employment lobbying activities of former county officials and employees has been approved in concept and will be scheduled for final adoption on March 8th. That concludes our morning session uh, for the regular agenda. The board will now recess for a closed session. And County Council, is there any reportable actions that we expect out of closed sessions? There will be no reportable actions. Thank you. Uh, we will resume with our regular agenda, uh, starting with item 14 at 1.30 p.m. And we'll now um, go to closed session. Let's start closed session at 11.45 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. It is 1.30 and I will uh, resume the Board of Supervisors meeting. For our afternoon session, we have a 1.30 p.m. regularly scheduled item. Uh, but first, clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. We are just waiting for Supervisor McPherson. Okay, thank you. Please make a note uh, when he joins us and we'll get started with item 14 to consider approval and authorization of submission of the proposed Mental Health Services Act Innovation Plan for a term of April 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2027 to fund building a system of care for people experiencing homelessness program to the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission to take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Health Services. And for a presentation on this item, I believe we have uh, Karen Kern, a Belt Services Director of HSA, and Monica Morales, Director of our Health Services Agency. Thank you so much, all of you, for having us here today. We're very excited to be here. It's another opportunity for us to share the hard work that's taking place to really try to increase uh, mental health services in the county. I really just want to provide, you know, a high level overview in terms of there's been a lot of work that's been happening in terms of trying to coordinate support services for our homeless community, but also thinking about the link and what does that mean when they're also impacted by, you know, other determinants of health, such as housing or transportation. So Karen Kurd will actually review in more detail the opportunity that has been presented to us through this grant to really increase our linkages and alignment with our community partners around these social determinant areas, 
but also really internally try to align the work that's happening at the county level too within our internal programs. And so now just kick it to Karen to really kind of give an overview and we're happy to answer questions obviously after the presentation. So take it away, Karen. Thanks so much, Monica. Um, good afternoon, Chair and Board. Thanks so much for making time on the agenda today. Um, I'd like to present on our MHSA Innovation Project. This project will run for five years and is funded by braiding MHSA revenue with the MHSA, I'm sorry, with the SAMHSA grant funding accepted by this board on uh, November 16th. And I'm Karen Kern, the Director of Adult Services at Behavioral Health. And am I sharing my screen for the slides or is somebody I don't see the slides. And yes, you should be sharing your screen. Oh, okay, great. Sorry about that. I understood it was the other way around. Give me a second. And let's see. I have my copy up. You got it? Okay. I think so. I'll make sure you can. Can you see it? Yes. You're seeing the slides? Okay, great. Um, see if I can advance them. Okay. Um, what are MHSA innovation projects? MHSA allows for uh, counties to engage in a research project to determine if a particular mental health need can be solved using new or innovative practice. Um, projects are funded by 5% of our MHSA revenue with a term limit of five years. And projects are focused um, on initiatives rooted in behavioral health data analysis and stakeholder engagement via our countywide survey. To develop this project, we looked at behavioral health data comparing 2019 to 2020, which was our first year of COVID operations. And then we dove into our community survey to understand um, our stakeholder priorities. We found that 500 fewer unduplicated adult clients were seen in 2020 than in 2019, the majority of whom were unhoused or unstably housed. And then in our um, winter 2020-21 community engagement survey, 75% um, of respondents thought we should focus on developing services to support people in housing, and 50% thought we should expand outreach and engagement activities. So we're using this project to help us better understand how the lack of housing impacts health outcomes, as well as to integrate health and outreach services with housing opportunities in our county. Okay, um, this project has two aims. The first is uh, seeking to support improvements to, in health, behavioral health and housing status for the people we serve, and then help them get on a path leading to wellness and stability. This means engaging people um, and enrolling people in services, providing uh, in-field clinical services and time-limited case management to transition people into a more stable situation. And then the second aim is developing a sustainable integrated model of care. Um, and that means understanding the needs and gaps in our community, leveraging technology to support integration and referrals, and then evaluating the model periodically using a plan, do, study, act process to demonstrate whether we're meeting project outcomes and how we might improve as we go. Oops. Okay, integrated care is the intentional and systematic coordination of general health and behavioral health, including mental health and substance use. And from a social determinants of health perspective, it also includes integration of other supports that impact health outcomes, like housing benefits and other supports. Um, an integrated team approach can support better health outcomes, and it also can save health systems um, money. And integrated model uses a person-centered approach meaning that the person receiving the centers is at the center of the model and that we are engaging people universally with dignity and respect and providing the services that they have identified. Okay, the services for this project um, have multifaceted dis delivery design. First, we'll be providing immediate field-based clinical assessment and care for health and behavioral health concerns in collaboration with HPHP street medicine team. This, this gives us the ability to go wherever people are. Um, and this will include uh, medication evaluation and administration. 
um, will provide case management using a critical time intervention model, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, we'll be offering peer support to maintain engagement and gain a deeper understanding of a participant's experience and needs. Um, we'll be linking outreach efforts with the work of Housing for Health Division to build out a system um, that helps people get on a path to permanent housing. Uh, we'll also be providing crisis intervention and support, um, as well as the ability to facilitate telehealth visits in the field if clinic-based services are indicated. Okay, so critical time intervention model is an evidence-based practice that's been studied nationally and actually internationally with our population of focus. Um, the model features a period of engagement um, to build trust and learn about a person's uh, needs and goals, followed by a phase to actually transition the individual to that service. And then we stick around long enough to be sure that a, a good warm handoff is made and that people are tucked into care um, and that the individual feels that their needs are met. Um, in most studies, the successful implementation of this model included an array of housing resources, including low barrier shelters with a variable length of stay in services, maybe transitional housing, permanent supportive housing. We don't have a diverse array of housing resources here in Santa Cruz County, so that piece will be a challenge. However, a big part of this project is understanding how to build a model that is effective for our community, um, and that is one of the things that we'll be evaluating. Okay, who are we serving? Um, the grant parameters focus on unhoused or insecurely housed people experiencing serious mental illness and potentially a co-occurring substance use disorder. Um, we're focusing in the cities of Watsonville and Santa Cruz. We actually use the point in time count and some HUD data to understand where in Santa Cruz we had the majority of people experiencing homelessness. We do have quite a few in the, um, uh, Oh, I just lost the word. I'm so sorry. Um, in the um, un, uh, the larger parts of the county, the unincorporated parts of the county. Sorry about that. Um, however, um, we needed to focus on those two cities to start with to get going. And then we have the hopes to expand to the entire county at, at some point. Um, and we'll be starting off with 600 people. And then again, possibility for expansion based on how well the model is working. A uh, typical participant might be someone who experienced early childhood trauma, maybe with a high ACEs score and maybe didn't get the services they need. Or it might be someone who struggles with behavioral health issues and hasn't been able to access care or treatment due to the chaos of homelessness. Um, might be someone who may be suspicious of mainstream or traditional medical or behavioral health care because they have experienced um, judgment from providers due to homelessness. Um, and then it also might be someone who lost their job and their home due to the economy or pandemic and who are now sleeping in their car, maybe on the streets, which then in turn may be having an adverse impact on their mental health. Um, and so the services provided through this project will provide an opportunity for participants to receive care wherever they are. It'll allow for participants to direct their plan and build those trusting relationships with providers. Um, it allows for us to coordinate all the health, um, outreach, and housing stability resources for our unhoused community. And then it also provides for a single platform to coordinate efforts and referrals and provide data on the people that we're serving. Okay, we will be partnering with Resource Development Associates to evaluate both aims of this project. Uh, the first aim focuses on processes and implementation of the services and that's how we will um, we'll continuously develop the model of care. Um, how, how is it integrating? Are we integrating? Uh, is there seamless movement across the continuum? Um, where are the gaps? And then the second aim focuses on the impact um, that the services are having directly on the people that we're serving. So are people getting healthier? Um, are they getting housed? Um, are, they, um, are they stable? How do we know that this model is working? Um, measuring efficacy of data sharing and integration means looking at the way people are using the tools that are available and whether or not we're seeing flow and connection uh, to services, making sure we're not duplicating services, making sure that all the different agencies that are providing outreach have efforts that are coordinated. Um, and then how do we know that people's experiences 
changing. Um, so we'll be developing a series of metrics to understand where people are at baseline, uh, how the model improves their quality of life with solid stability and less reliance on emergency systems or you know, fewer jail stays. Uh, let's see. Um, so a continuous quality improvement cycle um, is a process that allows us to periodically take a look at the both qualitative and quantitative data and what they tell us. Um, are things going as planned? Is there anything we need to modify? Um, is there something that we missed? Uh, what change might we make that could produce better outcomes or improvement? And then the staffing model for this project um, adds a total of 12.5 FTE across three program areas, um, three FTE in the grant and project management, uh, three clinical FTE um, adding to the street medicine team, and then six and a half FTE on the case management and peer support team. Um, again, the budget for this particular project, we're braiding the, the SAMHSA grant with MHSA funding with the opportunity to draw down additional revenue from FFP and FQHC billing. And then um, cross-department collaboration is critical to the success of this. We've been meeting uh, regularly with HPHB and HSD's Housing for Health Division. Uh, we are supporting um, the Housing for Health Division's um, sort of related initiatives. One is the 100 day challenge, um, which launched, I think, January 5th. Um, and that goal is that in 100 days, we'll safely and stably house 40 individuals living in encampments, 25% of who will be undocumented, and then connect 100 individuals in uh, to a housing pathway. Uh, and then we'll be there to provide the services for those people as needed. And then, um, also part of Governor Newsom's homeless package is the encampment resolution grant and behavioral health uh, supported housing for health in the application with the California Housing and Finance Council. Um, this is a competitive proposal to invest in sustaining pathways into permanent housing for people in um, unsafe or persistent encampments. And then people in our target population also align with uh, CalAIM's initial populations of focus for Medi-Cal reform. So we'll be working with providers in Santa Cruz and Watsonville to ensure eligible participants are referred and connected into enhanced, enhanced care management um, services um, for continued coordination, and then also to community support providers so they can access those available housing resources. And then, um, Current system is set up to ask somebody uh, seeking services the same questions over and over with multiple providers developing different care plans, some of which duplicate services. Um, so we're going to aim for health information integration. Um, and then in keeping with that person-centered and trauma-informed approach, we'll be coordinating information into one platform and one plan. Um, and then the success of this will hinge on our ability to continue working with Shio on these efforts. And we're building on the success of the whole person care um, pilot with the Together We Care platform through Activate Care for this project. And then finally, our evaluation plan for year one. Uh, we're currently at the first step. We had a kickoff event in our reviewing documentation and current uh, available data points so that we can develop our metrics. Next step is developing an evaluation plan and then providing training and developing dashboards. And then by the end of year one, we'll be performing data analysis and then um, building reports. Um, thanks for your time. And I'm guessing you might have some questions. Thank you, Adult Services Director Kern. Are there questions from members of the board? Yes. Yeah, so sure. Oh, please go ahead, Ron. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess, so my question is, as you said, there are very limited shelter options uh, in our community, and we have a large scale uh, crisis of homelessness uh, in our community. And I guess I'm wondering, what are we building into the DNA of this program, um, finding people shelter uh, or housing outside of Santa Cruz County? Because we put them on a pathway to nowhere. Uh, that is not, that's not really serving them and the outcomes we want and that they need, uh, nor is it, um, uh, or if we get to the end of the five years of this uh, study and we find out that 
that we just lack a bit of the shelter options that we knew going in. That's not a productive use of this very, very good and important program to uh, align services and prevent duplication and uh, do the outreach and problem solving. But I'm just wondering, are we, are we going in recognizing that we have very little shelter, that to the extent we provide shelter for this subpopulation, that's shelter that's not being provided to another vulnerable subpopulation. Um, and we're going in with a creative approaches to finding people housing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Claire, could you please, am I still sharing my screen or are we back off sharing? I can't find the apologies. I'm used to using Teams. There we go. I wanted to be able to see everybody. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. And so this uh, project isn't aimed at um, uh, exclusively um, utilizing what few the few resources that are available for housing. And part of the goal of the integration with our HPHP team, who's in the encampments and providing service in the encampments, and then our Housing for Health team, who is working on um, you know, developing those additional housing resources and managing the ones that we have. Um, we won't be supplanting, you know, any other group or um, or uh, you know any other population to to sort of compete with those um, the limited housing that we have. We will be hopefully partnering to expand um, expand opportunities where they're available. Um, if there are funding sources that we need to collaborate on or assist with or support for housing for health, and we'll be there to do that. Um, we'll have our, our case managers, um, we'll have the ability to uh, hook into the HMIS system, that housing management information system, which is the HUD system that's used for people experiencing homelessness um, so that they can see whether or not this person is um, already potentially has a voucher um, and doesn't know how to use it or doesn't even know they have it, maybe needs help with an application or things like that. So it's definitely not the intent to supplant other groups. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned is um, we have, I think, I think I might have those numbers somewhere here, but we have through some of our outreach programs already, our downtown outreach workers. And then I know that um, there's some that um, Dr. Ratner is tracking as well. We do participate in the Homeward Bound program and purchase bus tickets for people who um, you know, have family somewhere else in the country or state that they wanna try to go live with. Um, and we've purchased actually quite a few tickets this year, which I thought I wrote down. I can get it to you if you want. Um, but it's, you know, several dozen tickets that we've we've purchased for people since July, this fiscal year. Yeah, and I, I and I, I, the Homer Bound program is a great program. And I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm not interested in, you know, I, it's not just getting people on a bus, but it's recognizing that we have 2,000 people on our Section 8 uh, list. Um, and so if we give person a Section 8 voucher it, for Santa Cruz County, um, the likelihood that they're going to get housed is very low. Uh, and when we have 3,000 homeless people and 300 shelter beds, the likelihood that they'll even get shelter is very low. So I'm trying to figure out how are we building in for the 80% of people that, that, we, that we will not likely be able to find shelter for. Uh, in this county, even if we, even as we are doing, get grants, do Project Home Key, raise taxes, site shel new shelters, stand up all that, we're still going to, you know, we still look at three quarters of people not having shelter, assuming our homeless numbers stay, stay uh, steady and don't, don't increase through macroeconomic trends. So I'm wondering, like, can we connect people to Section 8 opportunities? in other parts of the country, uh, in other parts of the state? Uh, are we um, actively um, taking that as the first priority to find people places where the jobs housing balance is more um, attainable uh, for folks? And, and we should support them and provide them all this outreach and everything that we do. Um, you know, wherever they choose to go, but trying to trying to build in based on the scarcity in our community. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We can help people to move to more affordable living areas and we can help apply for affordable housing options in as many places as possible. So that 
that's not a barrier for us. Um, but we need the outreach to help do this well and make sure that people are connecting with somebody that can help them do those things. Yeah, and I and I and let me just say I I think that that sounds awesome. And again, I love this program in the way that it's um, both the goals and the the services that we're providing to people in need, as well as the an analysis. It just in our previous outreach programs, it hasn't felt like um, connecting people to outside resources outside of the county has been the priority or the focus. It's been a uh, it's been the you know um, down the list, and so I'm wondering if we can build it in from the get go as as a primary strategy uh, in this in this effort. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there other questions from board members? I have a brief question, and I may have just missed this when I was looking at the staffing model. Is this, will the grant funding or the funding just simply provide for a growth of internal staff or was some of this a, a contract out? It wasn't clear to me whether we were gonna be contracting out to other agencies or this was uh, gonna be handled internally. Yeah, um, sure, yes, uh, both. We'll have um, uh, additional FTE internally, um, some to behavioral health, um, some that'll be partnering with our uh, our larger HSA clinics and HPHP team. And then we'll be contracting with Front Street um, for the case management and peer support services. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Supervisor Cabot, you're on mute. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess uh, we have the, of course, Section 8, you know, waiting list and all that. Uh, there's a difference between offering a bed and offering a, a, a home. So uh, I know in South County, we have beds available, like at a rescue mission or uh, some kind of overnight shelter. And uh, that's good for, a, you know, a certain amount of time. Um, how do you uh, look at di differentiating uh, between the two? Uh, more of a permanent place to stay and uh, a temporary place to stay? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think that the shelter is maybe like a first step and a longer path to get into that permanent housing, whether that's permanent supportive housing, um, because somebody needs that extra support um, to stay in that housing long term, or whether it's living independently on their own. So it's not, you know, one or the other. It might be, if you look at it as a continuum, that, that shelter bed or that bed in a residential treatment program for mental health or substance use is like that first step off the street. Uh, and then we continue to work with people to transition from ideally without hitting the street again, that particular bed into a more permanent, stable place. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I thank you for this report. Uh, the public understandably has some hard time wrapping their, their arms around uh, the various programs that are being offered by our county and what we should be anticipating. Um, do we have any projections? Uh, and I sorry, I got in a little late. About folks who participate in the program and uh, where and when they might be housed and at whose expense. Yeah. So this particular um, project does not actually fund housing; it's funding services. Uh, so you know what, who is footing the bill for the housing will depend on um, largely you know what our housing array looks like over time. Um, and in terms of, I'm sorry, there's another part to your question I missed. Yeah, about um, you know where um, where they might be housed and uh, at, and at whose expense. Yeah, and so this is why we um, are coordinating our efforts with HSD's Housing for Health Division because they have the beat on the housing and they're managing yeah. our continuum of care and coordinated entry system uh, and vouchers and all of that. And so we'll be working with them. Um, to determine uh, what the most appropriate housing opportunity for the people we're serving will be. Okay. Yeah, I hope we can give us was commented on my uh, colleagues. Uh, just hope this can really uh, result in some great results. Um, or, or, um, and the, 
the question about permanent housing and temporary stabilizing housing has pretty much been answered. That was another question I had, but I think you've answered that all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, one additional question for you. Um, so you mentioned that right now the outreach services will be focused within the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville, and that's understandable given that's where the highest uh, uh, number of unhoused people are, though, although there are a substantial number of unhoused people in the unincorporated area. Is it, you know, what conditions would have to be met to expand the program to the unincorporated area, or is that even possible under the terms of this grant? Yeah, I think we we focused on the cities of Watsonville and Santa Cruz. We, we actually took the point in time count data and created a heat map. Um, Santa Cruz City has the highest number of people experiencing homelessness, and actually unincorporated Santa Cruz came in, you know, pretty much neck and neck. But because the unincorporated areas cover so much geography, it's really hard to develop um, sort of target those outreach teams to where those encampments might be. We tend to move around a lot; they're not as large. And so I think our goal is that then in, in starting with Santa Cruz and Watsonville, um, using the, the services that we're providing to develop the model and sort of hone the model to make sure that the model is working and that we're starting to see some positive outcomes. And then that will give us the opportunity to expand the model across the county. Okay, thank you. All right, seeing no further questions, we will open it for public comment. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? There are no members of the public wishing to speak to this item. All right, thank you. Then we'll return it to the board for action. Uh, motion will be in order. Move approval. Uh, can I add the additional direction that uh, that if you haven't already, you reach out to the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville to uh, coordinate with them and let the elected officials know about this new program? Absolutely. I'll second uh, the motion. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor Caput. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Okay. This is with additional direction to coordinate with the cities of Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Koenig. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We have uh, authorized the submission of the proposed Mental Health Services Activation Plan uh, with additional direction to coordinate with the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now move on to item 15 to consider a presentation on the Health Services Agency Department of Public Works and Information Services Department report back on implementing the My Santa Cruz County mobile app as a tool to address public syringe litter reporting, leverage resources, and improving overall litter efforts as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Health Services. And for a report on this item, we have HSA Director Monica Morales. Good afternoon, folks. And I also believe that Socorro Gutierrez is joining us. So I just want to make sure. Oh, there she is. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, I've just learned recently about this project. It's a very exciting project in terms of all the efforts that the county has been doing to really kind of uh, manage a lot of the soil waste, um, you know, in our community. So today we have, uh, you know, the Department of Services, uh, Health Services, myself and Socorro presenting to you, but also in partnership with the Department of Public Works and our Information Services Department as well. We will be sharing with you uh, the update on the actual implementation of this proposal, but also the app that has been um, scaled to really address the current need. So I'll just go ahead and kick it to Socorro so she can really give you more of the details on the background of what the project has been doing over the past couple of months, but also how we're really trying to leverage existing, you know, um, waste disposal resources in our county to scale some of the efforts. So Socorro, go ahead and uh, I'll kick it to you now. Great. Thank you, members of the board. I will see if I could, um, if I can do this successfully in sharing my screen. Can you all see that? Not yet. Not yet. Apologies. 
Let's see. Uh, can you see that? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Monica, for introducing the item. Uh, my name is Socorro Gutierrez, and I am the program manager over the Syringe Services Program, which is part of the Public Health Division and part of the Health Services Agency. I will be co-presenting with Ayman al Raifi from Information Services Department, as well as from with uh, Bo Hawksford from the Department of Public Works. As um, Chair Koenig uh, mentioned, our report back is based on a directive that was provided back on June 8th. And I would like to begin with just a reminder of our public health division's vision, mission, and values, which is something that we take to heart uh, in our everyday work and including in this project. What we're going to be doing is we'll be providing some background related to the implementation of my Santa Cruz County app. We'll also provide an overview of the development of the app function and also provide information uh, about leveraging existing litter response resources. So as um, some of you may remember, the Santa Cruz County Syringe Services Program has a three-pronged approach, and that is syringe distribution, syringe collection, and enhanced referrals. And as part of our syringe collection, we continue to provide personal sharps containers for SSP participants, our community partners, and pharmacies. We provide sharps lock boxes and containers for encampments in the city of Santa Cruz, and that was recently, uh, that is a recent development. We provide training on syringe litter and safer sharps handling um, uh, based on... Um, Excuse me, I think we're, uh, we're not seeing your slides in advance. Um, oh. Which slide should you be on Socorro and I can follow you. Thank I'll go ahead you. And share my slides. Uh, slide six. Apologies six. for that. No worries. We're, just, uh, we're all very interested in the presentation. So. Yes. Should I go ahead and start where, where you guys missed it? <laughs> Okay, let's see. I'm on the correct slide here. Is this the correct slide or is it the previous slide? Let's see. It's the previous slide, I believe. Next one. Do we want to start from the beginning? That may be the least confusing, yes. Okay. Sounds good. Again, apologies. Um, so we're here to uh, report back on our board director from June 8th, uh, which is about implementing the My Santa Cruz County app as a, as a tool to address public syringe litter reporting and also leveraging existing solid waste disposal resources. Next. As a reminder, this is our public health division's vision, mission, and values of which we use in our everyday work and also in implementing this project. Next. As part of what we will be providing uh, today, we will provide a background, some background information, as well as an overview of developing the app function and information on how we're leveraging existing litter response resources. Next. Next. So the Santa Cruz County SSP has a three-pronged approach, syringe distribution, syringe collection, enhanced referrals. And as part of our syringe collection efforts, we provide, we continue to provide personal sharks containers for our community partners, for SSP participants and our pharmacies. We've recently uh, worked with the city of Santa Cruz by providing sharps lock boxes and containers. We provide training on syringe litter and safer sharps handling uh, based on community need. And we also provide, continue to provide sharps kiosks countywide. Next. So here you can see um, that uh, our 
investment in litter related expenses has increased incrementally uh, throughout the years. Our total, uh, and as, excuse me, throughout the years, our county SSP budget is, um, comes from our general fund dollars, but most recently we were able to increase our funding through a grant through the California Harm Reduction Initiative. Next. So the utilization of the My Santa Cruz County mobile app um, was one of four recommendations to improve syringe litter reporting and response. The other recommendations refer to continuing to work with any relevant county departments to collaborate, as well as to maintain our existing disposal strategies and leveraging our resources around litter cleanup. Next. Next. So as we began working on this project, we naturally fell into our day-to-day -day roles. And what I mean by that is HSA um, worked on work to improve partnerships and service coordination throughout this project. ISD built the syringe function in my Santa Cruz County app. The Department of Public Works worked to respond and leverage litter and illegal dumping abatement program resources. Next. So we began with an assessment and part of that assessment was defining our internal partners and our capacity, as well as we began to think about this in a phased approach. And what we began to do after uh, finishing or conducting the assessment is we began to engage with our litter collection partners and also city jurisdictions. Um, and with their input, we identified data collection points. We developed a reporting and response process and we solicited input from our SSP advisory commission. Next. So phase one of this my phase approach is the actual implementation of the syringe litter reporting page. And that was um, that the it went live on January 25th. And the phase two is dependent on uh, the community becoming aware of this app and utilizing the app in which ISD it will provide the opportunity for ISD to address any technology or reporting data issues on the app. Next. Now I will be I will be introducing Iman to actually go into the uh, My Santa Cruz County app. Thank you, Socorro. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, chair, board members, my name is Iman Rafai. I'm the senior ISD programmer responsible for the My Santa Cruz County app. And by the way, the app is available for download from the App Store. This is my commercial. Uh, Google Play to, uh, stores for free. And you may not know this, but we do have a desktop version of the web app. And that is located at cconnect.santacruzcounty.us. Um, these apps were updated, as you heard, January 25th on the stores. And in support of such additions as the syringe litter. <clears throat> Now that all of you have downloaded the app onto your phones or devices, uh, you're going to open up the app. And what you'll see first is this first icon here, which is on the left. Uh, this image is uh, the uh, top little page that has a collection of pass-through links that uh, link to web-based applications, such as the vacation rentals contact, which will be updated later. Um, and you'll scroll up and down and you can find these pass-throughs. In order to report though, you would press, a person would press the report issues uh, orange exclamation button. And uh, if you move on to the next slide, you can see here from left to right, the workflow that would happen. <clears throat> you would be presented with uh, the countywide uh, selections and syringe, but you could slide your hand up and down and you can pick the links since it starts with an S, it's near the bottom. 
You press on that and you get a map. Now, if you immediately start pressing the map with a target, your thumb is about the same size as Santa Cruz and your accuracy be poor. So I often recommend zooming in as close as you can to your target and pressing on that point then. That makes it much easier. And you'll get a lat long. Um, and we do a, real, a geo reverse lookup if we can find an address. If we can't, we'll say there is no address because you're on a beach. And But we have the lat long. And you click report and we get to the next page, which tells about yourself. And the red fields are required. However, if you want to report anonymously, you can say your name is anonymous and your email is at anonymous.anonymous.com. Your phone number might be 8675309 um, or 12345, whatever you want to put in there. To help you, uh, we have links, which is the Serene Service Program on the page there. You also have questions. Uh, what type of litter was it? And did you uh, dispose of it? And we have a link to help you find locations where the kiosks are to dispose of the sharp, whatever you found. A description field, you can click on the camera and take an on-demand photo, or you can pick one from your library for later. So, and that addresses to the next uh, slides down below. But I just wanna point out that part of the, uh, my Santa Cruz County app has a capability where you can look at the um, different submitted uh, reporting that people have done on a map and you get a heat map of locations. And if you actually touch the icons, you can actually see uh, where the case is in development, like uh, submitted, uh, in process, resolved, and the colors match. The next page, please. Can I, can I ask a question before you move on? Sure. So if... If we sort of <clears throat> allow anonymous uh, entries and, or in fact, just told the public how to how to do it, why do we make the name, email, and phone number required? Why not make it optional? It's a great question. Um, well, <laughs> good one. Yeah. So, um, because I feel like you need to possibly put the opportunity to write something in, given a, a choice and just a prompt to write something, I guess you could leave it blank if you'd like. I mean, I, yeah, I think for sure we want to have that option in case people want a response back or want to tell us, you know, who they are. It makes tons of sense to have that contact info mm -hmm. where it's complicated and the location doesn't, we can't find the location or whatever. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just making it required feels like a barrier if it's not really necessary that it's required. I appreciate your comment. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. So next page. And this is the desktop app version it mirrors the behaviors and upper right corner to lower uh upper left corner to lower right corner in terms of the flow but you can see the same behaviors are there and let's see anything else i'd like to say that's it thank you very much for your questions and comments i appreciate that um I'd like to now hand it back over to Socorro. Sorry, technical difficulties. Technology is great, but when it doesn't work. Um, uh, so yeah, so now we would like to actually uh, introduce Bo Hoxford, who will be talking about um, how we're leveraging waste disposal resources. Bo? Hi, thank you, uh, board and Skoro for the introduction. Um, next slide, please. So the Department of Public Works, uh, specifically the Recycling Solid Waste Division, has had a litter program for many, many years. Um, we used to partner, well, we continue to, but we used to only partner with Save Our Shores, uh, who were primarily responsible for community cleanup events along the north, along the coastal areas and some of the rivers. 
Uh, we've ex we've since expanded those programs in the last few years, uh, beginning with downtown streets team. Uh, we began up on the north coast, um, and Save Our Shores would continue to do the cleanup events and some education outreach along the south uh, south coast. Uh, we eventually, within a few months, downtown streets was doing a great job. We expanded into the downtown Felton area, uh, into uh, about, I think we have seven hotspots in that area. And um, then we we also expanded into the Emmeline neighborhood, uh, which public works, uh, we, we only work within the unincorporated county. So we were able to leverage our money uh, with the um, health, Human Services Department and Health, health Services Department uh, by using what's called CFET money, which stands for the CalFresh uh, Employment Training Program. Uh, that program works, uh, you have to have matches of uh, non-federal non dollars, uh, which Public Works dollars and HSA dollars are, uh, and we were able to uh, expand the program into the Emmeline uh, campus neighborhood. Uh, which is fully funded primarily with uh, human services and health services agency money. Uh, most recently, uh, this fiscal year, we began working in South County with the Watsonville Works uh, through the Community Action Board to clean up area, to partner with the city of Watsonville and to clean up the areas uh, around the downtown area, including the levee. Um, we, we are also, uh, in this next fiscal uh, fiscal year, we we do I did I did uh, I did place some money into the recycling solid waste budget to further expand uh, the program uh, where you know where we can determine which areas uh, we will actually need that uh, would be based on uh, community and uh, the board's direction. Um, we. There is has been some further development since we developed this slide deck, uh, which we do anticipate receiving a grant from Caltrans uh, that will last two years from the date of implementation to receive a total of $160,000 or $80,000 per year to uh, assist with cleanup along the uh, state routes. Uh, so in South County, that would be 156 and 129 as well as up along the Highway 9 uh, and uh, Northern Highway 1 corridors. Um, we do anticipate being able to, uh, those programs are only within the Caltrans right-of-ways. Uh, however, our roads crews do clean up all along the unincorporated county roadways uh, and all of the, we, we don't, um, <laughs> We don't discriminate with the with the types of litter. We, we we if it's if it's on the ground, illegally dumped or thrown on the ground, we 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 do clean that up, uh, and it does include syringes. Um, and we I know we are planning on working more closely with the uh, with the cities in both the city of Santa Cruz and the uh, South County within Watsonville areas to further help with their programs as well. And with that, I will turn it back over to Sokoto. Great, thank you, Bo. Next slide, please. So although ISD, DPW, and um, HSA were the county departments that led this uh, charge, we definitely could not have done it without our community partners who helped with the success of implementing the syringe page that are function in Santa Cruz County app. Next. And in closing, next, I do want to um, share that through our public health values of collaboration, compassion, and respect, we implemented the syringe litter reporting function. We, des we designed a countywide syringe litter response system, and we strengthened our partners to improve litter control. So I want to say thank you, uh, Supervisor Coonerty, for providing that feedback on the actual app. Um, and if you have any more questions, I think this is the time. Yes, thank you to the entire team for that presentation and uh, all your hard work on this. 
and uh, board members and any questions, Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you. And I think we've made a lot of progress. The kiosks and the streets team um, are making a tremendous, are making a big impact. And uh, so I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, uh, <clears throat> I guess my, my question is, and I've read the material a couple of times now, it's not clear to me if I make a report of a syringe this, is someone to come clean it up? That's it, it, it's hard to tell. Yes. Um, well, we developed. We developed. We reached out to the city jurisdictions and each of the target entities to identify who in their jurisdiction responds to say if somebody calls in for any type of litter and syringe litter, and they provided those um, uh, specific the specific information related to who it should go to. However, you know, we, you know, that is the response there. We, you know, each jurisdiction has different timeframes as to when they uh, respond to the uh, litter report. And, um, you know, we would need to work closely with our jurisdictions in identifying that, um, you know, we, uh, yeah, so that's the answer to the question. There's really, there to, to date, there isn't uh, a way for us to identify whether that jurisdiction cleaned up the litter. Okay. Yeah, I guess that I, I, I would urge that when we passed this a couple years ago and then reaffirmed it unanimously, I think the idea was that people should be able to report it and then it should be get it should be cleaned up right um and like that's that's key component because often if, if we now have it and people report it and it's not acted upon people are going to be even more frustrated and angry than they would have even if we didn't have this app right because now they've taken time they've taken action they're upset about it like so so i think it's you know, I think the purpose of the direction of the board was to have um, cleanup occur quickly thereafter a report um, and that recognizing that the county has a responsibility um, as, as, an, as an entity that, that dispenses syringes um, to then clean it up uh, and not just leave it to the cities. And so, um, so I, I that needs to be built in um, other communities do it and so i just i just want to make sure because it's this is this could be end up being a after all this work could be a worse outcome than if we hadn't engaged in it in the first place well we're definitely still in a response you know in a um a phased approach in in a in the response system and you know we want to make sure that the app works um and realize that it could, you know, if we don't have a uh, full follow through that it could become an issue. But I, yeah. I do want to just stress that we're, we're in phase one, you know, the implementation. No, absolutely. And I guess my question is, when do we get to phase two? Because uh, I think we want to obviously have people test it out, make sure the app works, make it as user friendly as possible, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, I have 17,000 people in my newsletter. I'm happy to blast it out that, that we have this available, but I only want to do it if, if, if there's, if it's good, if people are going to see a good outcome from taking the time to report it. I'd just like to add when, so one of the recipients for that, actually, that's going to come when it comes to the unincorporated county goes straight to our uh, DPW roads dispatch. Uh, when anything comes into a rose dispatch, uh, generally we do uh, get to the that litter uh, within 24 hours, depending on when it comes in. If it comes in on a Friday, unfortunately, that might not happen uh, until Monday morning. Uh, however, we we have been very good about getting to uh, litter responses within 24 hours. Um, again, unless it comes in on the weekend or on a Friday, it. it it's it, it might not get addressed until Monday morning. Yeah, and I guess I'm worried about this in the city because that's where we see the 
the, most of our syringe litter. Um, and I want to make sure that we're getting a response. Again, I think it's the county should be um, providing that response. Uh, um, but I, but you know, you can imagine like a business opens up downtown. It's a kid shop. There's a bunch of syringes that are in the alcove. They report it. Okay, what do you are they like? What happens then? So to answer that question, um, the app. <clears throat> On the back end, uh, there's some magic patterns where, based on your geolocation of the lat long, it chooses which, uh, if you're the city of Watsonville, goes to this email address. If it's uh, the city of Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz City has uh, uh, its own application called CRISPR. And so what we do is we provide a pop-up link on the site that says, uh, we're going to continue to allow you to report to us, the county, about this because we want the data. But we also give them a link that allows them to go to the city as well and use their system to collect that information um, if they choose to do so. So it gives more ways to present the data, particularly about Santa Cruz, uh, how to get that uh, litter handled. Okay. But I guess then from a user point of view, I have an app. I want to report it. It finds out I'm in the city. I fill out the county one. I don't fill out a second time for the city one. Is the city going to get my information? Um, no, no, I don't think the city will. Okay, so we probably don't want to have people filling out the same information twice. We should figure out a way to have them go directly to the city if that's what if, if if that's ultimately who's going to get picked up, then we should um, we should have it just people should fill out the information once on our site and that gets exported to the city, or we get linked. I mean, it just just feels like it's it's this isn't as smooth as as it could be. And that's the challenge with working with multiple constituents like that. It's that uh, each has their own. Uh, way of handling the litter. And some of the challenges is to bring everyone on board and get that data going. So um, phase one. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I, let me just say, when, when I made this motion, my intention was that the county received the report and the county cleaned it up. Um, so it's, it's becoming complicated as we try to have uh, other jurisdictions involved. Um, so my hope was to keep it relatively straightforward from that point of view. Um, I understand the jurisdictional questions, but I also think that, that at the end of the day, if there's a syringe, it should be just cleaned up within a couple, as quickly as possible and as simply as possible. Yeah, you definitely bring such a great point in terms of some of the areas that we need to explore. And again, I'm, I'm missing my apologies, but I do understand too that we know that we definitely, the county are leading this effort and we need the support from the cities also to just make sure it succeeds. And so our, the pilot right now is really exploring, you know, what can we do that we all can get on board to support this effort with the county leading? Um, you know, there's tons of sites I know in the county just because I did work in syringe services many, many, many years ago. Um, and so thinking about how do we, uh, with the lack of capacity that we have in the county to really triage every spot, but also how do we continue to read, continue to address the issue and go to the sites um, that we have available and then partner with the cities to just enhance that capability. So I hear what you're saying. I definitely documented down in terms of opportunities in the app itself. And then looking at ways that we can, we don't want people to have to do double the work in terms of reporting either. And we want to maximize our partnerships with, you know, the different uh, cities. So we'll definitely continue to explore this um, based on the feedback that you're providing to us, because it's a really good point that you're making. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is actually, you, you've answered uh, with uh, 
uh, Supervisor Coonerty's uh, questions, uh, a lot of it, uh, part of the answer is we don't know exactly what, you know, we, what, what we can do and how fast we can do it. But uh, <clears throat> we, we have in uh, South County a perfect example of overlapping jurisdictions. Uh, we have uh, two property owners that uh, that's private property. And it's like the uh, uh, narrow end of a piece of a pie. You've got two, you got the church uh, owns part of the uh, property near the Corlitas Creek. And then you have a farmer that has some of the land, uh, but right behind, uh, right by the creek. And then, of course, we have the uh, county and the uh, state involved when it comes to who has the jurisdiction of the uh, riverbed and all that. So I guess the question I have, if it's private property, the private property owner is going to have to uh, help pay for the cleanup. Can the county just uh, supply the dump trucks and uh, and take care of the hauling away of uh, you know some of the homeless stuff and syringes and all that? Uh, what what responsibilities does the private property owner have of uh, cleaning it up? That 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 exact issue comes up quite often. Um, what generally happens when when we get a call for for cleanups that end up being on private property is we do refer them uh, to the planning code enforcement section. They'll go out and determine um, where that litter or illegal dumping or uh, encampment might be located. And there are funding, there are funds available depending on. Uh, it, it's a lot easier if there's a if it's within a riparian zone. We can use the uh, zone four money is to offset some of those cleaning costs, which we've done in the past. Uh, most recently that I can remember uh, up near Carbonara Creek by the M1 campus, we cleaned up. Um, so, so there is the, the problem with that particular funding is that it's, it's one, it's usually not enough Two, it, it gets spent <laughs> It gets it gets programmed very far in advance to the point where if we have an emergency come up, uh, that we we'd have to program that. So by the time we get the funding available for that particular issue, uh, it, it it could take it could take a little while. There are some Cal Recycle grants um, available for they call them farm 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 cleanup grants. They they don't always apply in these some these cases. Uh, they can apply in areas that have been impacted for generations as a, a local site where people have been dumping uh, dumping items. Um, we have applied for them in the past and been and been turned down uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, we we are hoping that, as your board heard earlier, uh, some there 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 we could potentially have some funding uh, in the form of some uh, uh, cup charge money that could become available for some of these issues that perhaps could even uh, help to offset some of those zone fours monies. Um, but the, the private property issue becomes rather complicated uh, unless it, it's a lot, but like I said, it's a lot easier if it's within, if the garbage is located within a riparian zone. Sure. But I, I want to thank, uh, Thank you and the uh, Department of Public Works for all you do. I don't know how many times we've had to call you for help, and uh, it, it, it's all kinds of different areas. I want to thank Monica also for everything you're doing. Um, I know uh, there's no easy answer to any of the questions that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Supervisor McPherson. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Cooney has asked many of the questions I had, but just basically, what do we hope to learn six months from now with the programs that are being applied? I mean, that this is where people are using more than, I, I, what are we hoping to learn from 
the programs we put into place as we move forward. Um, I don't have a real clear picture of what I might be able to receive. Hey, this is what's happening here, there, or elsewhere. I just, um, I don't know. I just don't see where we're going, actually. Uh, I don't know if I'm the only one that's getting a little confused on all this, but I don't know what we're, we're, what we're going towards to what the answer is what we want. Uh, and when we see the actual numbers of the syringes collected in the kiosk and through the contractors, I, I think that's a key component of this. That's my comment. Do you want to try answering that or do you want me to? We can't hear you. Thank you, Monica. One of the ultimate outcomes that we want through this uh, reporting is to use it as a tool to identify hotspots around the county to deploy kiosks, which is currently what we're uh, doing as a uh, mitigation to syringe litter. Um, and also to help us identify maybe specific areas that may need cleanup um, around the county or across the county. So that that's that's what I envision it to be the the, um, one of the outcomes. Yeah, I would emphasize, you know, we, we're as a county, we're definitely trying to expand and make it know that uh, available for folks to do the reporting, right? Obviously, this is a pilot. We're still learning. The questions you're bringing up are definitely going to help us think not just about the app and fixing some of the bugs in there, but also thinking about this is definitely a county uh, effort that we need partnerships. So hopefully what we're hoping is that how do we also align with the efforts that are already taking place in the cities and just really continue to champion that with the county hoping to just strengthen our data collection, our understanding of some where these hotspots might be, then for us to come in and really target those areas as well as we're doing the cleanup and increasing some of those cleaning um, activities. So ideally that's what we're hoping for again, you know, it's a pilot. And so, you know, we'll, we'll know more as we try to launch this to see hopefully if, if it succeeds or where we can tweak it as we're learning. Uh, then will we see um, at any time the, the syringes, the number of syringes collected at the kiosk and uh, through the contractors then? So I'll defer to Socorro, but I believe some of that is already being collected. And um, Socorro, I'll, I'll kick it to you because you have more of the details yes. at this point. Um, Supervisor McPherson, so you were um, asking if we have data related to uh, what, our, uh, what we're collecting in the kiosks and also through downtown streets team, correct? Correct. Yes, that is correct. We do receive uh, reports from the downtown streets team on a monthly basis on how many um, syringes are being collected at the different hotspots that they're doing, um, not just syringe cleanup, clean but they're doing overall litter efforts, cleanup right. efforts. Mm -hmm. And then we also um, do have um, weight totals for our kiosks throughout the county, which there's currently six. So we do have that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, you, yes, Sakura, you want to? Yes. Um, I just I just wanted to add that we definitely want to continue to, as Monica had mentioned, we can we want to continue to collaborate with jurisdictions across the county on developing a, a more robust response system. And I also wanted to add that. Although at, at this point in time, we are unable to push the information from my Santa Cruz County app to the CRIS program, but that is something that has been brought to the attention of the assistant IT director for the city of Santa Cruz. And that is the ultimate goal, but it's just right now, um, there isn't capacity on the city of Santa Cruz's um, uh, not capacity, I shouldn't say. There's different priorities and they know that they will be, um, that is the ultimate outcome for the two systems to talk to each other. So there's no, du du so there's, so to avoid duplication. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll admit I had the same 
uh, question is Supervisor Coonerty is, is you know wondering who is actually going to, to pick up the syringes once reported and have and share the same concerns. Um, I think if anything, it sounds like uh, we, we stand a better chance of of um, you know delivering on the promise of the app in the unincorporated part of the county where the road crews will actually uh, respond and pick up the litter as opposed to in the incorporated areas. So. Um, you know, I, I guess the question is, are, are we ready to go from just a open use of the app to promoted use? I mean, I, I too would be happy to blast it out uh, to my email list of, uh, you know, also around 17,000 people. Um, is the app ready to, ready to handle that? I'm seeing you shake your head yes. I'm in <laughs> yeah, I, I believe the app is ready to handle that um, because I think it's important to start immediately collecting data. And when I have information, I can make better decisions. And with use, you also get, um, for instance, the it's the same behavior as if you were to report a pothole, let's say. And we know right away that the, that, that has already been very effective. And when we do have a partnering with a third party vendor like Lucidity, um, we have the capability of directly pushing data into a system that DPW uses that immediately gives a better response time. So the work in the back end is always trying to connect with the different vendors or different people who will take that data and work effectively upon it. So that requires, of course, data coming in so that we can start really pushing the uh, needs and saying, wow, look, we need to, to put energy here and there. So I, I'm all for live testing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I mean, I certainly have a great deal of confidence in our county road crews. Um, you know, I, the, every time an issue has been reported through the app, um, you know, like you, as you mentioned, potholes or, or other things, um, the response time has been pretty incredible. In fact, I think it's one of the most functional parts of um, uh, our technology infrastructure. Um, so I suppose we'll just, I'll include that caveat that, uh, we expect uh, faster service or, or actual direct service to pick it up in the unincorporated area, but we're still working out the kinks with the cities. Um, yeah, I, I would just, I mean, I think I, I, I think in the spirit of the partnership that you all laid out, I would encourage that, that you check with the partners who, before 34,000 people get, and get a notice with an expectation that they're gonna get immediate service, um, that all the partners, are ready to go uh, full steam ahead. Yeah, we definitely wanted to bring this to you because we were scheduled to give you an update, right? So we wanted to at least give you a quick snapshot of where we're at, um, the site is live, get your feedback, make the tweaks, and then when we're ready, what, what we can do on our end is just um, you know, let you know we tested it, we've seen how it works, we fixed some of the bugs based on your recommendations or um, not necessarily bugs, but made updates and then send you guys the link so you can really help us, you know, send it to your constituents. Because I think at that point, we will definitely have had the ability to test it um, for a while. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, just want, I, I agree. It's important that we let the city know um, if this is going to go to a promoted status. And I mean, to the extent downtown streets team was mentioned several times uh, throughout the agenda memo. Um, I know that we actually, they, you know, they have a contract directly with us at the county. Have, have we talked about them um, or, or sorry, talked to them uh, and mentioned that, you know, this is data that we could supply to them or, you know, is there a form that we can give them the data directly? <laughs> we have been as part of our, um, planning phase, we in incorporated them in um, the feedback to provide around the data collection points. Um, and so the answer to that is is uh, yes. Uh, all, the city jurisdictions also know about the My Santa Cruz County app and of our intention around why we were looking for a um, response email or where um, the, if people reported on the app where it would go to. So we've we've worked really hard with our partners. So what form uh, would the downtown streets team receive the data in and, and how frequently? Oh, so the the downtown streets team, that's, that's one of the things that they, uh, when we brought 
some of our litter collection partners is um, the form is very similar. Um, it would have it has uh, the number of gallons they removed in terms of overall litter, as well as how many needles were removed specifically. Uh, I'm, I'm not asking about um, the data that the downtown streets team provides us. I'm asking, um, you know, how would they receive data input through this app um, that tell them, you know, places to check on their on their routes for needles to pick up. Uh, so let me save you there. Um, <laughs> So uh, we collect a list of uh, emails that um, we have uh, gotten from the different uh, agencies, and I create a piece of information that has the lat long, the uh, possible names, uh, connection uh, address, and the description of the trash. And then we send that email to the preferred location they would like to have that data dropped into. So that way, that particular receiving uh, mailbox would be addressed to hand it to whatever team is working on it. Absolutely. Uh, okay. uh, well, I mean, it sounds like there'll be some opportunities for improvement there as we make the handoff to uh, you know some of the vendors or, or community partners that are helping us with this. I mean, I can tell you uh, right now that uh, Emmeline is sure to be one of the hot spots, that general area. And, you know, I've already communicated with constituents in the area. Um, and while, you know, the, the memo mentioned that the downtown streets team is in the area today, but sort of is the answer. I mean, they go out three times a week and their current route uh, really just kind of goes up Emmeline Avenue and then hangs a right on Lee uh, rather than go around the, um, HSA campus there, uh, and in, you know they, they currently don't go around the neighborhood uh, really at all in terms of Wendell or Sutphin or, or other nearby streets. And so, um, you know, and I do think that you know ultimately, for we'll probably see quite a number of uh, reports from that neighborhood. I mean, I've received them in my office myself directly, um, and um, you know, there's. Ultimately, we've worked with the downtown streets team on what an expansion in the area would look like. Um, you know, I think it's about a thirty thousand dollar contract, and we go to five days a week uh, with a much greater number of streets included. Um, so, jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, that I, I'm sure we'll just see increased demand for <laughs> a contract expansion like that with some of the data we're getting. All right, um, if there are no further questions, is there anyone from uh, the public who would like to comment on this item? Yes, uh, Serge Cagno. Good afternoon. Um, I, uh, I helped uh, um, consult in setting up the, the vets halls for the COVID shelters. And there's, I really want to appreciate the work that staff has done for this and the advocacy that the supervisors are doing for this. Um, and having needles on the ground um, is a dangerous situation. Um, but I want to be clear, there was one comment that said uh, the county gives out needles, so the county has a responsibility of picking up all the needles. And there's jurisdictional issues, absolutely. But the one thing I want to say is our programming of how we do our syringe services has an outcome of about needles being on the ground, too. That our choice of having limited hours and limited locations and limited numbers of needles have an outcome of whether people are more participating and whether they're bringing their needles on the few hours that we have open hours on the few day on few locations we do so i just want to be clear that needles on the ground is also because of our choices of having limited programming i really want to appreciate everybody trying to keep the community safe um, and i hope you guys have a good day thank you mr Carno. All right, seeing no other members of the public with their hands raised, I'll return it to the board for action. Uh, so I'll uh, move the recommended action uh, with the, I'm going to add the additional direction that the uh, that this group returned to the board by June 2022 
with a plan to address the previous direction that the board gave in June 2021, uh, by which is to use our ex existing solid waste resources to come up with a systematic response to syringe collection by either expanding contracts with current providers and or releasing an RFP or RFQ to solicit such services, including potential on-demand response components. Um, so that was, uh, I'll just, that's what the board uh, voted unanimously for last year. Um, and uh, hopefully in June, um, after this testing and after these efforts, um, we can have some options as Supervisor Koenig just mentioned um, about expanding services to, to, to provide additional services. I'll second. We have a motion by Supervisor Coonerty, a second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That uh, report and presentation being accepted, we will hear an update in June, uh, including uh, about the uh, potentially used on-demand response components uh, with part of this effort. We will now move to item 15.1, which is originally item 62 on the consent agenda. One moment, please. Uh, that was... Uh, or is to authorize the county administrative officer to send a letter of support to the Chabo La Positas Community College District Office of Economic Development and Contract Education, supporting participation in the interjurisdictional California micro business COVID-19 relief grant program application for provision and distribution of $2,500 grants to eligible micro businesses impacted by COVID-19, negotiate and execute a fiscal agent agreement in an amount not to exceed $65,830, designated to the Chabot Las Positas Community College District Office of Economic Development and Contract Education to represent the County of Santa Cruz for the grant program application and take related actions as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. Seo Palacios, uh, is there anything further you'd like to add on this item? Um, Mr. Chair, actually, this is Zach. I, I pulled this item, so I'll do a brief overview, and then I would like to hear the CAO's thoughts on this. But I'm supportive of, of the item in concept. I, I just had some, uh, I was considering um, providing some additional direction or, or modifying the actions here uh, once I got some feedback from both the board as well as from the CAO regarding the fact that I had some concerns both about this 20% overhead number, but also the fact that the money wasn't staying local. I mean, and we do have a local SBDC and it, I felt that, you know, they should have an opportunity to uh, participate in the process. This was pretty last minute, obviously it was an agenda item. And so I wanted the opportunity for the board to consider a local preference for SBDC as part of this motion, as opposed to just simply handing it to an, an out of town community college district. So I would like to ask the CAO's office, whether um, such a thing would be possible or appropriate to modify the direction to expand uh, that opportunity. I have some language that I could submit if, if possible um, and just hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, CAO Palacios. Is there anything you'd like to say or Elisa? Go ahead, David. I can fill right. in as needed. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Friend, for elevating this issue. And uh, thank you, uh, Chair Koenig and other members of the board. Uh, we have had an opportunity to talk to SBDC and we do believe that they're a qualified and experienced partner that would be more than capable of administering this program and serving as a fiscal agent for the county. If we would like to designate them to be a respondent on the county's behalf, that's we can do that. Uh, what happened with us here was that in late 21, the first round of funding came out and Santa Cruz County was eligible for up to $329,000. And due to workload issues, we weren't able to apply at that time, uh, much to the disappointment of some of our local partners. Th these are funds that are definitely sorely needed by small micro businesses in the community at this time. Uh, round two funding has come out and the same constraints that we had before are in place for us as far as workload. However, the eligibility has changed to allow a nonprofit to represent the county and responding to the RFP. 
uh, Shabolas Positas Community College had reached out to us early last week and offered to bundle our county in with other counties in a joint RFP response. And we thought that this was a preferable alternative to leaving the money on the table. Uh, we moved forward with that, quickly put an item on the agenda for your board to consider and reached out to our partners in the community and SBDC did respond that they would like to have an opportunity to represent the county in this uh, RFP response. And so here we are at this point, um, looking at an alternative direction that, that the board could consider. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Your actions are totally reasonable um, and appropriate leading up to this situation. And since new information has come forward, I think it would be appropriate for the board, at least in my opinion, if my colleagues would agree to add this additional direction to have SBDC as uh, part of the consideration. Um, Mr. Chair, I don't know if you or any of my other board members, colleagues have any comments on this. If not, we open up for the community. I'd like to introduce this possibility of, of expanding the direction to include SBDC with an alternate recommended action on this. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Are there any questions from members of the board? Uh, I'm I'd be supportive of that in general, but let's hear from the public. Any other members of the board? Seeing none, uh, I'll take to the public for any comment. There are no members of the public wishing to address the board on this item. All right, then we'll uh, return to the board for action. All right, Mr. Chair, this is a, a lengthy motion. Uh, Madam Clerk, I, I will send this to you to ensure that you have it in writing as well, but it'll, obviously I'll read it into the record. So my motion would be to direct the County Administrative Office to work with the local Small Business Development Center as a preferred local partner to submit a California Microbusiness COVID-19 Relief Grant Program RFP response on behalf of the county and authorize the CAO to negotiate and execute a fiscal agent agreement in the amount not to exceed $65,830 designating the SBDC to represent the County of, of Santa Cruz for the California Microbusiness COVID-19 uh, Relief Grant Program. Should the SBDC determine it cannot respond to the RFP on behalf of the county to direct the CIO to proceed with the recommendations to partner with the Chabot Las Positas Community College District Office of Economic Development and Contract Education to respond to the RFP and serve as a fiscal agent on behalf of the county. Second, second all of that. If that's a motion. <laughs> that was a motion. It's a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of our regular agenda, and we will uh, now adjourn until our next meeting, which is on March 8th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Thank you, and meeting adjourned. <laughs>